from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Hi everyone, I'm Kate Murray and I'm from the Library of Congress. And please allow me to welcome you to Designing the Future Landscape, Digital Architecture, Design and Engineering Assets. And before I introduce our opening speakers, I'd like to say a few words about what to expect for the day. We, and by that I mean our stellar organizing committee, uh, which is comprised of staff from the Library of Congress, the Architect of the Capitol, and the National Gallery of Art, have been uh, on planning this event for over a year. We all sort of bumped into each other uh, when we were exploring these complex and dynamic digital collections about 18 months ago, and we thought there must be other folks out there like us who are looking for opportunities to share information. It's a hum, right? <laughs> for, to share information, to build communities of practice. So we decided to work together in what really has been a model of interagency cooperation and collaboration. And in this, we include our colleagues from GSA as well. And we want, are bringing together thought leaders, content creators, technologists, members of the archival communities, that is to say all of you, to talk about the development and implementation of open standardized file formats, case studies and current projects and practices, and future looking approaches. And we have our engaged and supportive program committee to thank us for bringing this to fruition. You know how sometimes program committees are more about moral support? This was not one of those program committees. They were true partners in bringing this event about and we owe them a sincere and heartfelt thank you for allowing us to pick their brains and raid their contact lists. We'd be remiss not to also thank the special events, music division, and multimedia staff at the Library of Congress for their important and valued contributions. And of course, we're grateful to all of you in the audience today for sharing our passion and curiosity about all things ADE. A few logistics for the day. The restrooms are out the door near the yellow corridor, although I think the ladies' room one is broken, so you might have to go down the hall a little bit. Breaks and lunch are on your own in our cafe, which is just across the hall. It's actually pretty good. I usually get the Korean rice bowl or the sushi, but you can find something that you like. We expect to have a dedicated pay lane, so look for some kind of a sign that says architecture design and engineering or special event, and you can get in that lane, although you can pay anywhere. There's also a Subway and a Dunkin' Donuts on the G level. We won't spend time in our sessions on speaker bios, but you can read all about them on the conference website. Our hashtag is, eight, is DIGADE2017, and it's case sensitive, as you see there on the monitors. And we hope you flood Twitter with posts throughout the day. The wireless network is lock guest, and you need to accept the prompt in your web browser to connect. This event is being recorded for later, re later release on YouTube and other social media platforms. So we ask that during Q&A, you wait for the mic to come to you before posing your question. And please note that participating, by participating in this event, you acknowledge that your image and voice might be captured on these recordings. Speaker slides will be available on the conference website in the near future. We'll also have a report coming out in 2018, which will be authored by Eliza Leventhal, covering the main themes and topics of the day, and we'll write, widely distribute the links to all of these resources. If you have any concerns or questions uh, during the conference today, please seek out a member of the organizing committee, and we have stars on our name tags. And finally, we invite everyone to join us for a no-host happy hour down the block at Bullfeathers at the end of the day. This is the start of a conversation, and we're thrilled you can all join us, so let's keep it going. Without further ado, I'd like to introduce Mark Sweeney, Dep Acting Deputy Librarian of Congress, followed by Stephen Ayers, Architect of the Capitol, to get us started with welcoming remarks. Mark Sweeney is currently serving as the, librarian of Cong the Library of Congress's Acting Deputy Librarian. Prior to his current appointment, Mr. Sweeney served as the Associate Librarian for Library Services. He was responsible for carrying out Library Services' mission, which is acquire, organize, provide access to, maintain, secure, and preserve the Library of Congress's universal collection. This vast collection contributes to the advancement of civilization and knowledge throughout the world. Throughout the world, documents the history and culture of the United States, and records and supports the creativity of the American people. On May 13, 2010, President Barack Obama officially appointed Stephen Ayers to a 10-year term as architect of the Capitol. Mr. Ayers is responsible for facilities maintenance and operation of the historic U.S. Capitol building, the care and improvement of more than 570 acres of grounds, and the operation and maintenance of 17.4 million square feet of buildings, including the House and Senate 
congressional office buildings, the Capitol Visitor Center, the Library of Congress buildings, the U.S. Supreme Court building, the Thurgood Marshall Federal Judiciary Building, and other facilities. He's responsible for the care of all works of art in the Capitol under the direction of the Joint Committee on the Library and is responsible for the maintenance and restoration of murals, outdoor sculpture, and other architectural elements throughout the Capitol complex. Please join me in welcoming them to the podium. Good morning, everyone. Again, I'm, I'm Mark Sweeney, the Acting Deputy Librarian of Congress, and on behalf of the Librarian of Congress, Dr. Carla Hayden, it's my pleasure to welcome you to uh, today's program. We are uh, pleased to host this symposium in collaboration with the Architect of the Capitol and the National Gallery of Art. Let me take a moment to provide a little context uh, for the Library of Congress's commitment to architectural and design heritage. The library is both the oldest federal cultural institution in the United States and the world's largest library. Since its founding uh, in 1800, its collections, which are universal in subject matter, have grown to over 164 million items stored on more than 838 miles of shelving. The collections include more than 38 million books and other print materials, 36 or 3.6 million recordings, 14 million manuscripts, photographs, 5.5 million maps, 8.1 million pieces of sheet music, and 70 million manuscript sheets. What's germane to our discussions today is the fact that the subjects of architecture, design, and engineering are woven into all of these different collections. However, the largest concentration of design sketches presentation renderings, and technical construction drawings are in our prints and photographs division, which is also home to the Center for Architecture, Design, and Engineering. The division's extensive holdings include original designs by many of the most distinguished designers who worked in the United States, including Benjamin Henry Latrobe, Robert Fulton, Richard Morris, Hunt, Cass Gilbert, Frank Lloyd Wright, Charles and Ray Eames, Raymond Lowy, Paul Rudolph, and of course, I am Pei, uh, just to name a few of the giants that live here at the Library of Congress. We are also fortunate in having the archives of two prominent professional organizations, the American Institute of Architects and the Engineering Society's Library. I don't have time to tell you about all the great research that's being done with our architecture, design, and engineering collections right now. However, to give you just a tiny bit, uh, that will give you a glimpse of what's going on. I'll mention a few examples of the work that's being done with the Paul Rudolph Archive. The Urban Land Institute is using the archive to further its study of urban planning and renewal. An architect is studying Rudolph's Florida houses in order to understand changes in building codes and their financial impact. Architectural scholars are studying Rudolph's building techniques and materials, particularly his use of concrete. And finally, preservationists and architectural historians are looking closely at examples of some of Rudolph's most notable public buildings, such as the Jewett Art Center in Wellesley and the controversial Boston Government Services Center. In closing, I'm sure today's panel presentations and discussions will help us achieve a better understanding of the challenges inherent in acquiring, preserving, and sharing important born digital assets relative to architecture, design, and engineering. And I hope the remarks of the Library of Congress curators and others will stimulate you to explore our magnificent collections. Thank you. Thank you, Mark, and thank you, Katie. Good morning, everyone. It's great to be here today. Let me start with uh, a brief story about the first major restoration of the United States Capitol Dome that we recently completed, the first in a generation. You may have seen the scaffolding uh, going up or coming down, and we completed that uh, terrific job uh, in January of this year, just before, or December of this year, last year, just before the presidential inauguration. The dome, as you may know, is made of nearly 9 million pounds of 
cast iron girders, plates, columns, and cast iron ornaments. Even the pedestal upon which the Statue of Freedom sits is made of cast iron. And as we were gearing up for this restoration effort, we used CAD drawings, of course, of the Capitol Dome that we had prepared many years before to help us develop the scope of work, to help us document the more than 1,300 cracks and deficiencies and repairs in the cast iron that we were about to uh, undertake. And these digital assets or these CAD drawings were incredibly helpful to the work we were doing, but they didn't contain the important stuff, the important details of the fasteners, the connection points, and all of the cast iron parts. It wasn't exactly like working with a virtual erector set that showed how all of these uh, hundreds of thousands of pieces that fit together to make up this dome. You can't necessarily see them all either the fasteners and the connection points because they're hidden. They're inside spaces that uh, have, haven't been, haven't seen the light of day in more than 160 years in the gutter systems and balustrades and those connection points are what are important to us and what were important to our contractor. And so despite the amazing technology that was available to us, the most important tool in this restoration project was the roughly 200 original watercolor drawings from Thomas Eustick Walter in the 1850s, two of which you can see right there on the screen. Thomas Eustick Walter was the fourth architect of the Capitol, and his drawings were a tremendous in documenting exactly how everything would fit together back in 1865. By sharing these drawings with our contractors, they were able to develop their means and methods by which they would go about disassembling all of the pieces of this dome, restoring them, and then putting them all back together. And that reduced our risk immensely on the job. They were particularly helpful on the balustrades, some of which you can see here essentially serving as a paint-by-numbers kit. And it's amazing the level of detail of these drawings back uh, 160 years ago. I could spend the next 30 minutes talking about the state of our design drawings today produced by our engineers and architects and how we can uh, uh, draw an outline of this particular dome, make a bubble around it, and say, the contractor needs to prepare shop drawings for all of this. Well, back in the 1860s, the architect of the Capitol did all of that, and uh, Walter made all of those connection points, and they, in fact, we don't have shop drawings because his design documents were essentially the shop drawings for that. But that is for a different gathering. Today, fortunately, we, we are blessed to have some incredible archivists at the architect of the Capitol that were able to pull these drawings together, the ones from Thomas Eustick Walter, more than 200 of them. They were stored on a uh, network drive, just a couple of hundred gigabytes of data that had been stored on that drive for a number of decades. While we were working on the dome restoration, we also took the time to pay it forward to our future colleagues as well. We used BIM 360 to document all of the work that we did, whether it was uh, including the photographs of existing conditions once we took nearly a quarter inch of paint off the dome, lead-based paint that is, documenting the conditions that we found, documenting the original repairs or repairs that were done uh, in 1959 and 1960 that is, and uh, paid it forward for our colleagues that might be undertaking similar work some 50 or 75 years from now as they go about restoring the Capitol Dome once again. In the short term, we're confident that we can mine this data to diagnose uh, 
problems that we may have with the dome and uh, our maintenance activities. And in the longer term, of course, it will be useful. This BIM 360 model will certainly be useful only if it's in a format that can be assessed by future architects of the Capitol, again, 50 or 75 years from now. And as much as we want to cling to paper, it's just not realistic, as you know, as it won't last forever. So we need to capture documents in their born digital formats. And certainly, we're all here today wrestling with the same questions. What's important to keep? What are the challenges of keeping it in perpetuity? How do we protect the digital record for the long term? And perhaps most importantly, for me anyway, how do we make sure that our colleagues in the future, those that might undertake the repair and restoration of this great Capitol Dome 50 or 75 years from now, how do we make sure they can use it? Well, I hope by the end of the day you can figure all of that out. <laughs> That's your challenge. and. Uh, I'm delighted to be here. I hope you have a great day. I look forward to hearing the results of your work. And uh, I'm quite certain you'll be able to figure that out by the end of the day. So good luck. Have a great day. And thank you. So thank you, Mr. Ayers. That's a bit of a challenge. Um, I think we'll do our best by the end of the day. Uh, and thanks to Mark Sweeney also for, uh, for those wonderful welcoming remarks. So we're going to start with our first session, which is going to be Eliza Leventhal, Katie Pierce-Meyer, and Tim Walsh, and they're going to give us an ADE primer. Thank you. Good morning, everyone, and thank you all for coming. Um, I am Katie Pierce-Meyer. My colleagues Tim Walsh and Eliza Leventhal and I are, going, are very pleased to be asked to provide an ADE formats primer. Essentially, what we're going to do is give you about a one-hour introduction that covers the history and preservation issues associated with architecture, design, engineering, and digital content. We'll each take on a particular period and identify key trends and preservation concerns. I should note that the three of us come with a bit of an architecture bias, um, but we're very interested in exploring the connections to and overlaps with other fields. So. I will introduce the early years, provide a little bit of a background on early CAD development from the 1960s through the 1980s. My colleague Tim Walsh will take on the 1990s and 2000s, a very active period in technology development and increasingly complex preservation challenges. And finally, Eliza Leventhal will discuss software, current software and preservation landscape, setting us up for the remaining sessions today. But first, let's start with a look back. So the use of computer-aided design applications in architecture trailed similar implementations within engineering and manufacturing. Stimulated by mandates from the U.S. Air Force in the 1950s, airplane engineers and manufacturers were early adopters and testers of computer technology for design. Computer-aided design and drafting, manufacturing tools, um, and techniques were developed to use machines as a means of increasing speed and precision while decreasing production costs. In the aerospace in industry, automated drafting tools were widely used in the 1950s, and the needs of manufacturers resulted in innovative software programs for pro uh, project management, data collection, and engineering. Research and development intensified in the academic community, however, in the 1960s. Ivan Sutherland, uh, his 1963 electrical engineering doctoral dissertation, and his development of the Sketchpad system are widely credited with being a significant contri contribution to computer graphics programming. Sutherland was working at MIT, along with Stephen Coons, to rethink the interaction between humans and computers. Uh, he and Coons envisioned a computer-aided design system that would allow multiple designers to interact with the system simultaneously, to communicate effectively with each other, and to, quote, use the creative and imaginative powers of the man and the analytical and computational powers of the machine. While these researchers were approaching the problems from an engineering perspective, their work demonstrated possibilities for computer graphics that held promise for applications to architecture. The idea was to create, move, copy geographical entities using a light pen. By the 1960s, 
Several conferences were organized to bring professionals together, kind of like we here are here today, to discuss the possibility and implications of using computers in architectural practice. The goals of the conferences and associated publications were to present information about current efforts in using computers um, in architecture and related fields and to open up a discussion about the potential use for creative design. There were also conversations about the role of the architect and what that looks like if you start adopting computers in your practice. So there was a little bit of an apprehension on the part of some architects about embracing computer technology um, because of the uncertainty of the value of the technology and concerns about potentially changing their role and status. A common theme in the conferences and publications uh, focused on educating practitioners about computers and addressing their roles as architects. Now in the 1970s, we saw the beginning of the first commercial programs available to the market. Um, these are just a few examples of those that were available. They were, however, very expensive. Um, in his 1977 book, Computer Aided Design, William Mitchell predicted that developments in architecture and computer technology had finally reached a point where the tools uh, would, quote, radically transform the practice of architecture. So what was coming down the line, a lot of things re regarding um, personal computing and uh, just a lot, of a lot of changes within um, computer technology that were gonna make these programs a little more accessible and, and as you'll see in a moment, change just the nature of the field. So <clears throat> the book was written as an introductory guide for architects, students, and computer technologists to try to bring them together um, to think about the developments in computer technology and what was possible in architecture. So he encouraged thinking about design as an information processing task which, uh, in which one conceives of the mechanics of managing data. So it was about data even in the early days. Um, he was concerned about a, the seeming hostility from architects, um, their ignorance of the potentials of, of the computer technology, but mostly the financial constraints of relatively small firms. It was, um, he noted that the challenges were particularly great as compared to other fields where computer-aided design was implemented more readily, specifically automotive and aerospace engineering. Um, one point he made was that the relatively small size of firms and the economic investment necessary to bring computer-aided design to such firms meant that the adoption of the technology needed to be perceived as necessary or valuable to the industry, not just to individual firms or individual practitioners. It needed to be sort of a broadly applied um, to have real value and to be perceived as having real value. So what are some of the preservation challenges from this period? You know, I've introduced kind of a lot of big ideas around what was going on in those early days. Um, there's not as much in the way of, as far as I know, um, large quantities of records available in terms of the technology, but there are some, and I think identifying where those are, um, where different repositories might have um, different things that might help us preserve what was tried, what was debated, what was presented to various audiences, um, what has value, both for the history of design records, but also for the history of computer technology, because some really interesting things were happening during this period, and there's sort of blending and merging and, and borrowing ideas and technologies from other uh, fields. So looking at that, I think, is one of the things that's really valuable. Um, there's also the experimentation and adaptation to new, new markets. Some of the technologies um, were created for one market and then used within another, and I think that's the kind of thing that we might want to be preserving and providing access to. So, moving on to the 1980s. The 1980s can really be characterized by a proliferation of programs. As I mentioned earlier, there's sort of a change in computer technology, several changes that allowed for why a wider array of um, people to have access to the technologies. <coughs> they were becoming less expensive. Um, numerous mar uh, vendors entered the market. So this is a very long list that is by no means comprehensive um, of all the vendors that were entering this particular space. Some were specifically focused on architectural software, while others expanded their offerings to the architecture and design market. So numerous companies competed to create and sell CAD software to firms, um, including Autodesk, Intergraph, Bentley, Dassault, just to name a few. So in the early 1980s, firms began adopting computer-aided design technologies, some firms, in large part because the development and affordability of computers occurred in concert with years of research and discussion within the industry. So another thing I like to point out is that all of this happened 
you know, um, over a long period of time. There was a long period of discussion that was occurring that, you know, architects were sort of debating what what their role would be, how they might implement this, whether it was worth it. So there's a kind of, there's a whole lot of sort of social and political and economic considerations that go along with all these changes in technology. So just to give you a little bit of a, uh, a view of some of the advertising that was going on during this period in the 1980s. Um, this is taken from several different journals uh, in the mid 80s. And one of the things I thought I'd mention was that the editors of Architectural Technology, a publication of the American Institute of Architects, organized two rounds of CAD evaluations. They called them shootouts, um, and published the results in 1984 and 1986. Uh, they evaluated numerous programs. Um, architects evaluated them. And by the 84 review, AutoCAD was already pretty acknowledged as the de facto standard for affordable CAD. Um, and by 1986, it's noted that uh, most of them were expanding into giving 3D possibilities um, or 3D models of, of buildings as well as 2D plans, elevation, and construction drawings. So one of the things that was revealed is that there were many affordable options for CAD software in the mid-1980s. So it wasn't as easy as CAD just came, you know, AutoCAD came in and took over the market. There was, con there was a lot of competition during this period and a lot of... Um, a lot of different software out there and a lot of different companies making this software. So, um, let's see. From the 1980s through the 90s, this substantial uh, competition existed with AutoCAD really becoming a predominant tool within the architectural community by the 1990s, but by no means the only tool. Um, others have persisted and digital assets that produce produced by these programs have a lot of value. One thing I would like to note is that during this period, there's several preservation things to contend with. So a lot of this software was sold in, in hardware and software bundles. So one thing we might need to think about is not just you know providing access to software, but thinking about the hardware used to access these materials, which we would in, in most cases anyway, but there's some really interesting and different hardware um, that might have come with some of these programs that we would need to contend with. Um, there's as I mentioned before, development or adaptation across multiple different fields. Um, there's a lot of proprietary systems that we're just starting to see, and you'll hear more about from Tim. Um, I'd also argue that preserving the context of these assets, the history of these vendors, is very, I think, interesting and, and significant. There was a lot of mergers, a lot of um, um, bankruptcy, or people choosing to get out of uh, CAD, but also people choosing to merged together with another company because they were stronger as one. So I think that kind of history might also help us when thinking about the challenges we're dealing with. And just thinking about telling a broader story about computer-aided design technology for architecture. So collaborating with colleagues to identify and address the <coughs> preservation uh, of legacy assets is part of the challenge we're here to address it today. And I'm very happy to introduce my colleague, Tim, to tell you about the 1990s. Good morning, everyone. Um, I thought I'd take a second, if we can um, just together congratulate Katie, who just successfully defended her PhD. So, and on very Thank similar topics, so you have the right person introducing the early days of this to you. Um, so picking up with the 1990s, I think uh, one thing that's important to acknowledge is that, um, you know, there's some arbitrary distinctions here. Some of the things that I'll characterize as like from the 90s or from the 2000s, um, it, it's not quite so linear. People weren't always working on the same time frames. There's a lot of trends that stretch over time. Um, but um, that said, we'll, we'll kind of stick with the, the uh, narrative for now. Um, the 90s really saw sort of two divergent trends. Um, in aerospace, automotive, engineering, um, we started to see a lot more market consolidation um, around a handful of systems. Um, this is probably largely because in these fields, um, the longevity of assets is just as, if not more important than you know, the creativity of the design, um, which is, I think, something that we'll hear a lot more about later on with projects like the LOTAR project. Um, but really, we saw um, quite a lot of consolidation around tools like NX um, 
and uh, Katia and Pro Engineer, um, largely by uh, these sort of gigantic firms like GM, who <clears throat> not only standardized around the software, but actually in some cases, you know, purchased it and guided its development. Um, at the same time, in architecture, we sort of saw an explosion of the amount of software that was being used um, and experimentation. Um, you know, even people taking software, um, realizing it didn't quite meet their needs and sort of scripting around it and hacking on it a little bit. Um, and a lot of this is related to the development of 32-bit operating systems and personal computers that actually had the processing power um, to compete against these larger Unix-based uh, mainframe applications that had previously kind of dominated the market. Um, so when we get 32-bit operating systems like Windows NT um, with more advanced graphics ca capacities, more advanced processors, um, suddenly a desktop application could actually be um, just as viable as a mainframe application uh, at a significantly lower cost, um, which opened the door uh, to smaller firms, um, to students, to people working at home, um, which really kind of changes the game when it goes from being basically a technician doing the CAD or, you know, a very trained professional doing the CAD to anybody. Um, you know, where now, you know, a student, like one of the first things they're going to do is open up Rhino and start doing 3D modeling that's very, very different than what it used to be. Um, we also have the development, sort of the brief rise, um, like fast rise and brief heyday of silicon graphics, um, which is, I think, a history that um, uh, has been kind of written, but in relation to this field um, is really important to think about. Um, because essentially that meant that there were these commercially available systems um, that were miles and miles beyond in terms of 3D modeling and animation, anything else that was out there, um, that were largely used in other but related spheres. And I think this is something that I'll talk about a little bit, um, I'll keep talking about a bit. Um, like animation, the film industry, special effects, um, so basically you have software that's being written for these machines that's being used to do advanced CGI work that's then getting taken by firms like Asymptote and applied to do visualization um, of the New York Stock Exchange, for instance, um, which becomes a part of a built environment. Um, and these sort of crosses between these disciplines, um, I think, complicate the history, make it a little more interesting. Um, so some of the software that we see in this time period, um, a lot of it's not new. Uh, Form Z would be an exception here, which uh, came out in 1991. Um, but existing systems like MicroStation, Solid Edge, SolidWorks, AutoCAD, um, really sort of develop the 3D capacities either for the first time, like AutoCAD uh, comes out with release 13, um, or they sort of um, continue to develop the 3D capacities that were already there to the point that they're actually um, you know, viable commercially. Um, and um, I'll talk about this more in a minute, but I mean, these are some of the systems that, that basically won um, in this market that Katie was talking about with a lot of competitors. There were a lot of other systems out there. Um, um, but these are the ones, you know, they're, they're still around, they're still in wide use. Um, we also have, um, like I said, this sort of parallel trend of 3D modeling. Um, this largely coming out of film, games, um, uh, special effects. Um, so Power Animator becomes Alias, Alias becomes Maya. These things are basically used to create the, the dinosaurs from Jurassic Park and the liquid, spider, or the liquid um, Terminator from Terminator 2, but then get applied to architecture um, and design and engineering and sort of change the way that not only uh, models are being created, but also how they're presented. Um, things like, um, you know, have, being able to do animated renderings and photorealistic uh, video walkthroughs of what a building would be like kind of changes the interactions that people have with clients on top of how they're actually doing the work. Um, and a lot of the software is still around. I mean, even big budget movies are mostly still using things like 3ds Max, Maya, um, which were largely developed or and or bought by, by Autodesk for the most part. Um, this is um, a couple of the other software programs that were around. Um, this is a, the desk next to mine at work. Um, some of the old software that were disk imaging. Um, but uh, just to show that you know there are lots of names out there too that you don't necessarily remember. I think I agree with Katie. I think it's a fascinating history that deserves a little more a little more attention. Um, uh, 
there's a lot of experimentation. And what this means is that if you are a place like the CCA where I work or um, you know, a library archive museum and you're getting the archives of these projects, like these are just a few of the file extensions and softwares that you're potentially contending with. Um, you know, I think we have, a, we have a tendency from our historical perspective now to think like, oh, it's like AutoCAD and Revit and maybe MicroStation. Um, but there's you know, dozens and dozens of software programs and file formats that we potentially have to contend with, which is, I think, a thing that we should keep in mind when we're talking about things like, um, like best practices for working with these legacy collections, um, you know, that um, file formats like STEP are fantastic, but it doesn't necessarily mean that we're going to have a converter into these open file formats from all of these previous softwares uh, that came before. Um, some of the preservation challenges come again from this sort of um, just variety of applications out there, most of whom were proprietary, um, most of whom um, didn't sell that many copies. These applications are also extremely expensive, so it's not like Word or something where you can buy a copy off of eBay because it was in almost every home. Um, at this point, even tracking down, tracking down the software to begin with um, can be a real challenge. Um, experimentation and practice as well, I think this is something I might be a little biased coming from the CCA, which is usually interested sort of in um, developments in theory and practice uh, more than sort of the end products of architecture. Um, but you know, uh, in our collections we see from this period um, a lot of scripting, um, a lot of creative experimentation with software, which means you have to get creative in response when you're thinking about how you uh, preserve access to this material over the long term. Um, one of the things that which continues before is Katie, or begins before and continues um, even now is that it's an extremely protective market, um, which means, like I said, the, the licenses are expensive, but also that we're dealing with things like dongles and hardware keys where the application won't work if you just have a copy of the application and a license. You also have to have something physically plugged into a parallel port or um, or USB port. So if we're thinking about like, oh, maybe one potential solution to this is we preserve the old software and we run it in emulators, which is something we're going to hear more about today. And there's a sort of added layer of complexity because how do you, um, you know, how do you convince this software that's not actually running on a physical machine that there's this dongle plugged into a physical machine without actually going in and cracking the software, which is um, not exactly allowed by US or Canadian uh, <laughs> law. <laughs> Um, without explicit permission. So these things start to complicate some of our potential solutions a little bit. Um, proprietary hardware platforms, like Katie was saying too, you know, SGI was fantastic. It was also extremely expensive. So people like Neil Denari in architecture only got copies because they were hanging out with people in the film industry. Um, uh, so it's not like there's a hobbyist gamer community emulating these things that we can then use to, to emulate it. Um, you know, so the, there's whole challenges there. Um, and I would say, you know, finally, it's sort of lack of like fully interoperable vendor neutral file formats. You have things like, I just as long established by this point, STEP um, is in development um, by the 90s. Um, but it doesn't mean that all these software programs can actually write data into these interoperable file formats. Um, it doesn't mean that data isn't lost in the migration. Um, so just a thing to, to keep in mind. As we go into the 2000s, um, essentially we see sort of further development of these tools, especially around 3D modeling and scripting. Um, probably the biggest thing though is just a wider adoption, um, that these software programs get more advanced because there's more time, but also more money because the market's bigger. Um, we see the development of things like SketchUp and Rhinoceros that really lower the barrier um, to entry um, for things like modeling. Um, also a lot of really interesting um, automated fabrication, 3D printing, um, so people start to play with materials a little more, think about what um, can change on the construction site, what can change in the process of creating the materials that ultimately go to the, to the site. Um, one of the biggest things, which actually starts in the 90s, um, really, technically maybe before with Autolisp, um, but is a, a, this like sort of experimentation with scripting. So in the 90s, you know, if you look at a software like Maya, which is largely used for like animation um, and special effects work, but tends to get, like gets used in architecture um, and design as well, um, you no longer have to program outside of it and figure out how to interact with the, the program. They start to build in capacity for scripting. So Maya, um, um, has the Maya embedded language, or like MEL language, so you can actually script within the program to do things like generative design. 
That eventually gives way to more standard programming languages like Python, and then you know in the 2010s, like Eliza will talk about, that gives way to even sort of easier uh, methods of scripting. So they start, these things that people were doing as experimental practice in the 90s start to become normalized um, as part of like typical practice. Um, and finally, but certainly not least, um, for the 2000s, um, we see the real development of BIM. Um, if you look at the uh, sort of AIA membership surveys at this point, um, you realize that basically um, Revit gets developed in the 2000s, ARCHICAD becomes, you know, fully, um, unarguably BIM software at this point. Um, but not that many people are using it yet, except for the really large firms. So something like, you know, 16% of architectural firms are using BIM software by the mid-2000s. But um, IFC is in development, the software is there, there's a lot of evangelizing going on, a lot of discussion going on, um, which sort of leads us up to the current moment. Um, so, uh, unique preservation challenges for the 2000s. Um, you know, all this use of, of scripting, of parametricism, of experimentation around the software means a lot of dependencies and a lot of data that's potentially lost if we migrate between formats. Um, always complicates things. We have much more complex workflows, which for someone like me means um, I might get what appears to be the same model in four different file formats from four different software packages. And unless you have documentation from the project, you don't necessarily know what the order that things happened in was, um, because they might be doing initial modeling in one thing and then porting it to something else for rendering and porting it to something else for creation of construction drawings. Um, and sometimes it's a lot more complex than that. Um, so it starts to, we start to need um, quite a lot more documentation to understand the work processes. Um, a vast increase in the number of files and file size. Um, so at this point, as the software gets a lot more complex, the assets get a lot bigger, um, which has real sort of economic concerns. Um, which I think, when, especially when we're talking about the cultural sector, has a big impact when we're talking about collecting because we have to actually be able to pay for all this redundant storage um, to meet our digital preservation best practices. Um, and finally, a challenge that I think is um, not related to just architecture and engineering and design, um, but certainly universal, is partially because these files were so much bigger, there was so much more data, um, people didn't want to keep the stuff on their computers and servers anymore, and people were told that it was best practice in the 2000s to use things like archival gold CDs that were guaranteed for 300 years um, that I can't read 10 years later. Um, and LTO tape, which degrades over time, um, you know, there was a really common practice, a lot of architects were like, we'll burn our archive to CDs now. Um, and these are things that we have to contend with now. Um, it basically means that there's a ticking clock um, where a lot of data is sitting on removable media that's in people's closets, um, it's under the stairs, it's rapidly degrading, um, and things have to get migrated off if we want to even have the assets around to begin with in order to preserve um, and provide access to them. And with that, I will leave it to Eliza to very competently continue the, the talk. Thank you. So as you see, the zoo continues. Um, it, doesn't, it doesn't get smaller, it continues to grow, and these are just a sampling of some of the software. Um, I, I am the archivist for Sasaki uh, Associates, um, which is an interdisciplinary design, design firm that includes planners, landscape architects, graphic designers, including environmental graphics, um, lots of architects. And, um, and, and so as a result, this is a pretty good assessment of the, the software that we use at my firm. It's not everything, but it's a good assessment, um, which also tells you that there's some, um, while we have a, a skew towards architecture, a lot of these, are, these tools and resources are being used by the other disciplines as well, mostly because you can't design a building and not have a way to put what the landscape is gonna be in that same model. It's impossible, you can't really do that, it's a bad idea. Well, I guess you can do it, but I don't recommend it. And so, <laughs> and so it's important to understand that this is not, um, uh, we're not looking at a, a microcosm of, of our system. It's a larger ecosystem, and these, these software are working in between uh, different, different disciplines. Um, but the important thing also to think about is that um, as some, some uh, software like Revit is becoming more, uh, more robust and heavier, clunkier, bigger, can ha handle more data, we're also getting really light things, like Tim mentioned, of Rhino and SketchUp that are um, really easy plug and play, which I'll talk about in just a second. Um, that facilitate um, much 
easier access and for you to do different things at different times. And so the workflow issues that Tim's talking about, and I talked about just a minute ago, um, get more complex because you're like, oh, I see a SketchUp file. That was only during schematic design. Great. Nope. Nope, that's not the case. Um, because sometimes you'll want to do a piece of that massing in SketchUp and then import it into Revit. And then it's there. And now you're building on top of that. So it's a very confusing, um, and I'm sorry for everyone who is not familiar with all of these software. I'm going to explain them in just a second. My apologies. Um, but it, it, the workflow is really confusing because you might think that you know when something was used based on what the software is capable of, but it's kind of a you know, the Wild West continues. We thought it was only really in the 90s when everyone could sort of hack and, and c break their software, but it's continued to evolve. It's, it wasn't an anomaly of the 90s, it's actually the trend, um, which is great. Um, but two of the main things that come out of the 2010s is really parametric design and computational design and visual scripting. Um, visual scripting is particularly interesting and it comes a little bit later, so we'll focus on parametric design for now. Um, the, the software that's included on this list um, the large blue R, R, R is Revit. Um, it is a building information modeling system, and it definitely has the lion's share of the market. Um, it is incredibly robust because it can handle uh, engineering. Uh, mechanical and structural engineering can be added on, or you can take those layers off. Um, it's really helpful for that. Uh, the bumblebee and ladybug and all of that, um, uh, the, uh, there's actually a, a whole zoo that exists for um, engineer, uh, for energy modeling and um, more environmentally oriented uh, data uh, elements and, and for programming. And then Rhino and SketchUp, um, as I'll explain right here, um, are the much lighter weight uh, software. So this is, should just give you a basic primer of what we're looking at um, in terms of uh, gradation of intensity. Um, and so starting at the top, um, it's much easier. You can really, like first day of class in, in design, uh, any design program, you should be able to just you know, hop on and start playing around. It'll be super confusing at first. I, I have worked with it and it's very confusing. Um, but once you understand the, the, the lay of the ground, it, it makes it much easier to come into these other software. Um, and so you start understanding what massing is, what, um, uh, what different uh, layers can look like and different uh, levels of texture and, and materiality that you can apply to it. Um, Alternatively, we've got Grasshopper and Dynamo. Um, so Grasshopper came out much earlier and was meant to be paired with Rhino. Um, I'll just go there and show you that, so that's helpful. Um, so these, Grasshopper was designed to work with Rhino, and Dynamo, which is this fun four-corner thing that has an arrow going to Revit, um, comes from Autodesk, and they basically, um, sorry, yeah, Revit, great. Um, they basically are intentionally designed software to pair with another software, which is an entire market that evolves. But a lot of the time, the software like Revit, Revit has just kind of made itself this wonderful amoeba that can just continue to accept things in. Um, so more things can be imported into it and it can handle exporting into a different, um, uh, um, a huge range of different file types. So it's sort of just becoming this sponge that can handle taking everything in. It becomes a really heavy software though, and that's really dangerous when you're working on a very large project. Um, there's the chance for uh, not something to get saved back to the file correctly as many people are playing with it. Um, not playing, working in it. Um, and, uh, you know, and so it, it, can become, it can become much more complex and difficult to, to parse apart and find where the errors happen because you're working on a much larger scale. The wonderful thing that comes with visual scripting is that it allows um, designers to very quickly get into that the landscape of, of programming and providing some of the automation that the 1970s had hoped computers would offer them because if you've ever worked in a um, in any of these software you know you don't want to really be the one that has to number every single room in a dorm um, as you're <laughs> working on the floor plan and so that's what one of the things that Dynamo can do for you is it will automatically create that if you run that script it can create numbering systems um, and so it lightens the load for the designer to not have to focus on these granular details that you really don't want to mess up and instead you can rely on the strength of the computer to fix that for you if you've applied that that element so that's a really hopeful thing that's come about but it does create a lot of layers of issues that I'll talk about in just a second this is the layer of issue. Um, so <laughs> this looks really simple and clean, right? Oh, obviously, one-to-one. -one. Yeah, that's super, except that's not really what happens. This is an actual diagram from our sustainability uh, uh, lead in my firm, and she, she created it to explain how certain data goes from one area to another in order to, for you to create certain energy modeling uh, assessments. And so I'm not gonna get into all of the various critters on the, st on the screen, but the, the important thing to understand is that it is a really complex problem that we're dealing with because this is just for her part of a project. Like, that is a very small portion of a much larger animal. 
and we're not even at construction administration yet. Like this is <laughs> during design phase, you know. So, and for everyone who might not know, every, not, might not understand the full phases, there's schematic design, which is where you would want to just play around with massing and come up with a general concept. There's design uh, documents. That's when you're working more in honing the design and really cleaning and clearing it up. And then you get into construction documents, and that's when things get really firm and more concrete to actually then make it into concrete. Um, and, so, <laughs> and so this comes much earlier than the actual concrete moment, but th like this, is, this is the landscape that we're dealing with. And I can tell you, <laughs> it's terrifying to me. Um, I'm sorry, that probably doesn't make anyone here feel very good, but, um, <laughs> but it's, 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 a, it's a scary space to be in uh, to recognize that when you accept these files in, even at my firm, there's a good chance that some of these won't have get, be saved to our, our billable drive. It'll be something that she was working on on the side, uh, in, this, in this case of the sustainable, sustainability coordinator, um, just testing something out, and then maybe that doesn't get back. And so, that, that, I mean, that's like w one orphan record kind of situation. But for someone at a collecting institution, that becomes a much bigger issue, and it's something that needs to be talked about in terms of appraisal, which is not what I'm here to talk to you about, so I, pro I promise I'll stop there. <laughs> we'll continue with the primer. Um, that's just some nice little doom and gloom for everyone to keep in mind. Um, so then it, more doom and gloom, but also excitement, um, is that now we're moving towards the cloud, and so more collaborative environment, higher impact um, in terms of uh, firms can work across the country with each other, they can work across the, uh, the world with one another using uh, platforms like GreenBIM and A360. Um, I include Adobe Creative Cloud because it's also an incredibly robust uh, cloud-based suite. And basically what we need to be worried about here um, is who owns these records? Um, because they're being hosted on their server and it's not that I think that any of the servers are untrustworthy or have poor security or anything like that, but it's about figuring out the right regulations, if we're the prime on a project and we have sub-consultants that need to have access to certain parts, how do we protect our, um, our model from any, you know, mis mischievous uh, goings on? Um, and so <laughs> you have to keep that in mind as, as we think about, well, the model, the business model then also changes, so the expense is going back up because not only do you have to have your, your copy of Revit 2018, but then you also have to pay separately for A360. So now a firm with, that would normally pay a set price for one year for that person to have one thing is now paying basically double that for every single person who needs access to it because of the way that the subscription model has been set up. And as software becomes software as a service and subscription models rather than you buy that software and you have it on your, on your computer and it's something that, oh, well, Katie's gone on to another place so we can take her copy and give it to Charlotte, you know, that that's doesn't work any, anymore. Um, and and it is this, it's something that as people who are gonna be collecting this stuff in 20 years need to think about now because there has to be a proactive solution um, because otherwise we're all kinda of in trouble. Um, and so, and so that's, that's something to keep in mind because we're getting more exciting as well. So A360 and BIM, uh, Green BIM, uh, BIM 360 that was mentioned earlier, they're all really exciting platforms and they allow the designers to do incredibly innovative things as a result of being able to work in real time across the world and with each other in different spaces. However, we need to keep in mind what does it mean when the project is done and how do you get those, those, uh, those records back. Um, so then we'll talk about something fun again, which is about um, augmented reality and virtual reality. These are the new ways that uh, firms are beginning to uh, communicate with clients. So building models is still huge and it was really important to materiality and expressing the idea because visual literacy isn't something that everyone has at the same level as a designer who went through Fiverr seven years of design school. Um, <laughs> and so, so it's great to be able to provide um, a relatable way to experience building. Um, and one of those is virtual reality has become um, a, a new way of communicating. And so sometimes we've been able to use it and actually share it with our clients. And sometimes it's just for the designers to get in the space and see what it's like. And virtual reality is really interesting because as you see on the screen, Revit and Enscape, you can just pull something right in. You can make a change in a Revit model and it'll be immediately reflected in Enscape, which is really cool, but then you can also do that for a SketchUp model, which SketchUp just has a little button and you can go into virtual reality mode. And so again, what happens to that record? Because there's no way of knowing that someone did the virtual reality mode of their SketchUp model. Maybe they wrote down in context, maybe they have it in a meeting minutes with the client that they showed them that, but it's, it, the context is really important and it's, it's one thing to know what the software is capable of, it's another thing to know what did someone actually do with the software. That is the question um, when it comes to understanding what is available. And then augmented reality, 
I was also told by somebody that there's like mixed reality, and I don't know what that is, so I'm sorry. But <laughs> <laughs> augmented reality is where you apply, like if anyone's familiar with the game Pokemon Go, where you basically put a layer on top of what you're experiencing. So this could be really incredible for planners who want to show like this is what this, this square could look like now, or this is what the streetscape could be going, like walking down you know, Pennsylvania Avenue. They could just change things, and so you could see what layers get put on top of rather than um, sitting in an office and looking at a model on, on, on your table. You could walk and experience that yourself. Um, and the potential for that is immense. Like I, I'm so encouraged by what, what is possible, but then like how do you save this? Especially if it's made as an application, well then now we have to worry about holding on to a cell phone <laughs> type that this was made for. <laughs> and as we all have experienced, even if you're really nice to your cell phone, maybe it's not always gonna be so nice to you. So that's something to think about um, <laughs> when, when we work through these things. Um, and so to end on the wonderful part of new preservation challenges, you'll note these are basically the same ones that Tim mentioned earlier. They just get more intense. So, there's more scripting, and that's great. It's increased the number of dependencies, though, because now we have more data involved, um, and there's more exp experimentation as it has become democratized. So it's not only um, you know, the, the incredible experimental, experimental and early adopters that Tim has at the CCA, the records of, um, but now it's literally every student can try experimenting and creating these new, um, these new concepts at a very low low barrier, um, and so that just means we have a whole lot more experimentation instead of only 10 people messing around, we've got thousands. Um, the workflows are, like I mentioned, as you can see, super fun, workflow number one. Um, and so the workflows are getting much more complex and that adds a whole new spectrum of um, understanding the provenance of the records, understanding the intention of the records, um, and then worrying about how to actually get those records when they are done. Um, as, uh, as an archivist for a firm, it's a very complicated process of getting the records when a project completes because there are so many different ways of defining when a project is completed, especially if you continue to work with a, a client for you know, 30 years, maybe that project's never actually completed, but then it's 30 years of records that have not, not been cared for, and that becomes much more dangerous as we move uh, more into digital, and if people think that it's safe to leave things on CDs, uh, we, might, we might be in a bind. Um, we are in a bind. Um, <laughs> so, <laughs> um, and so then the last two are a vast increase in the number of project files and file size, um, and that means more in terms of like affordability, like the sustainability of an archive being able to handle collecting more material. If your first three collections, you didn't realize that you needed to change your appraisal guidelines, so now you have six terabytes from, you know, Eliza Leventhal, Congratulations, but that's that's not that's not great if you are now 45 people in and they also want to give you all three terabytes that they have if you don't have the bandwidth to literally house it um, and you don't have the the, fu the funding to support that that becomes a problem that we need to become better at articulating so that we're more careful in how we're cu curating our collection which is a dangerous thing to say uh, because we don't want to be pre-selecting too far too much, but we also need to be protecting ourselves for the long term. And then the last thing is actually digital deliverables, and that's something that I'm really hopeful for and hope that we get to talk a lot more about today, which is that there is now a need for this. So before it was, like, wouldn't that be nice? Ah, this is really frustrating, I don't know what to do, but if these files are becoming contract deliverables, that means that in perpetuity they need to be available. It's not just being kind to our future colleagues and future designers that need to reference these, it's a legal obligation to provide <laughs> these records for long-term access. And so it's a call to arms, not only for the preservation community, but for designers who are agreeing, who are signing these contracts, saying, yep, I will definitely give this to you in very, various level of detail, BIM model. Yowza, all right, you need to like have a way to do that, and you need to help e educate the person who's claiming that they want this file to then move, be, um, be able to receive it and then and protect it for the long term because that's the whole point is that they want to move that one file to uh, you know rule them all sort of thing. That's what Revit's promise was, or not Revit, but BIM's promise was that if I have this building information model, I can have the designer design it, they can give it to the contractor, the contractor can build it, add whatever notes they need to in the process, and then they can hand it to the facilities manager. And that's a really beautiful idea. We're just not there yet, but the deliverable, that contract deliverable is the thing that's gonna get us there because there's no other way <laughs> to ensure that something will get done unless there is a very huge amount of liability <laughs> to not do it the right way. Um, so I know that's not a very exciting way to end that, but it is, I, I think it is really hopeful and I 
hope you also think so. Um, if you have questions, feel free to ask us. Um, we're all really excited for today. This feels like a long time coming. Um, I know we're a little quick, so that's all. <laughs> Hi, everybody. We all spoke really fast. So we're wondering, would you guys be willing to take some Q&A? Sure. Great. So um, if you have questions, we'll have mics. Questions, anyone? No questions? Longer break time. Oh, the one in the back, Phil. Yeah, you, we'll, we will get a longer break time, so that's okay. So. Maybe, uh, maybe because this was the last thought I heard from Eliza, uh, do you have any examples working at Sasaki for what are deliverables currently? How are you, I mean, surely you're delivering products. How do you, what's your best, least common denominator? Yeah, so oh, is this on? Does this work already? Yep, can you hear me? Great. Super. Um, glad that's been recorded now. Um, so, <laughs> um, yeah, so Sasaki is, is working with some projects that do require it. Um, uh, the, um, I believe it's the BRA, the Boston Redevelopment Authority, or whatever it has now been renamed. Um, we were doing a project for them, and they were asking for Revit as their, or a BIM model as their deliverable, and they provided the standards that we had to comply to. So it was a very well thought and articulated deliverable that we were able to uphold to. Um, I read I read what they were requ requiring, and it seems like because they were the the um, client is, also owns a copy of the software already because they're this is how they're planning on moving forward. It's a much easier option because they're planning on just holding things in a, a version of the software and then maintaining it at that level, so that changes things a little bit for us. Um, I don't think that's going to be the case almost ever um, in terms of like if you think a university is going to keep a version of every software that you. Uh, you know, make a uh, that you you work for like that's that's kind of a crazy option, but um, that that's what I think is going to have to happen for the beginning is that these pr these clients are already having a version of the software for themselves to be able to read it, and then the next thing is figuring out how uh, how do we make this so that it can be <coughs> long term access and it's not dependent on if it was a 2016 or a 2017 file because corruption does happen at that point. Yeah, that's all we've got. Yeah. Thank you. Can we get a mic? Oh, I might add something real quick, um, which is that if there are any software vendors in the room, um, that means there's a business case for licensing us your old software, um, and not just librarians and archivists. Um, it does come in handy, uh, and we would pay if there was an option to. Hint. <laughs> <laughs> the mic is on the way. Eliza, you talked a little about problems of, of, of assessing or determining ownership in the cloud environment, and I thought that was fascinating. And I wondered if, if Katie or Tim had any comments on I issues about the same problem with respect to the earlier periods that you described. Probably not much cloud in the 70s, yeah? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, but not cloud, the cloud, but no. owner, ownership. Yeah. Right, right, ownership, okay. The question doesn't go yeah. so much to the cloud mm -hmm. as it does to issues about who owns what mm -hmm. and to what extent they appear even in the free cloud environment. I think there's always going to be issues of who owns what, but I think in most cases um, it'll come down to, you know, those were the products of the firm and so that they own them and they have then an ability to to um, hand over rights to those files. Um, I don't know, in the case of where I work, I'm dealing mostly with printed documents as opposed to software. Um, Tim has more experience with software from this period. I don't know if you've run into this particular issue. Um, I don't think we run into an issue of ownership with the, well, there's a, an issue there's a question about ownership of software and transferability of licenses if we get old files as well as installation media for old software, and that's a thing that quite a lot of people are talking about who are quite a lot more legally qualified than me, so I'll just leave that there. Um, but um, otherwise, I don't think much ownership issue on that level. One thing is that, um, you know, there's always a question, but I think this was true before, of whether you know, the architects can also give us the engineering records and all that, and that depends on their contracts um, and how they've handled that. Um, so that's sort of a case-by-case -case issue. Um, 
Yeah, I, I think in terms of accessibility to content though, it's mm -hmm. very similar in that right now I'm spending, um, my team is spending quite a lot of time basically like disc imaging old media, everything from like zip disks and CDs and floppy disks and SideQuest cartridges and whatever, um, <clears throat> as like overhead to actually getting access to the content. Um, and I think that overhead is remaining, it's just changing, where now it's going to be you have to figure out how to get into these third party servers managed by other people and get the data out. Um, and you know, it's not just us that's dealing with this, the digital forensics community um, is really seeing a change in how they work from going to like evidence that's physically inscribed on a disk to transactions being on third party corporate owned cloud servers and figuring out like how you know, it, it requires a whole change in the way that you work. Um, um, but that's just always true. You know, formats evolve and, and we evolve with them. And I've had other concerns, I guess, lately. I've been thinking a lot about privacy and security um, and providing access to just any sort of building documentation in general. So this is something I'd probably like to work a little further on to think about this kind of issue. But I think that's one thing to keep in mind, too, is we're always talking about data about buildings or about um, the built environment in ways that we might want to be sensitive to or need to be um, legally responsible for what we provide access to in terms of um, privately owned structures and that may have security issues um, for you know, individuals or uh, <coughs> society in general. So that's, um, I guess, where I'll leave off on that. I've got one here. Hi, um, Kate, Tim, and Elise. It's Kurt Helfrick, and I just want Hi, to Kurt. thank you all for a fantastic presentation. I mean, I think you've really shown us so many things that some people remember maybe way back in the day, but you've given us a really great overview and assessment from today, so congratulations on that. My quick question, Elise, is I think you're spot on about the, um, the contractual obligations as a driving force for trying to get some of these things in standards that we can accept. I do want to share with you something. In my current position, this isn't true, but in previously at Santa Barbara, we were very careful as collecting repositories never to claim to be the legal repository for yeah. the materials we were collecting. And I think I want to remind people that that's still definitely the way for research collections. Um, the question I had really is, I'm just going to throw this out to you. Do you think it's going to take some serious legal lawsuits to actually be able to then get these things developed? Or is it something we can really reach out and, and work on? So I really hope it doesn't take that um, because it's terrifying. Um, but the, for instance, the $6.1 billion revenue loss that happened for Airbus in 2006 um, they had a problem with CATIA. They had two different versions being used. One was in Germany, one was in France, and then when they tried to build the plane, mm -hmm. the wires weren't long enough. Whoops. And so all of these flights got delayed and they had to you know, change a bunch of things over and these planes were supposed to be able to handle double the capacity and would be able to fly around the world in one tank of gas. It was like you know, this crazy, awesome new plane that they were making and $6.1 billion is definitely a reason why LOTAR now exists. Super, thank you, Lotar. But um, which also sets the precedent. Um, it's an ISO standard for the aerospace industry. Sorry for anyone who isn't as much of a nerd as I am and is excited about Lotar. But um, that, like, th so that that set a precedent for us. And so luckily, we have someone to talk to us today here. Yay! A little bit about what that experience is. But I think that my chicken little shtick for quite a while has been, well, it already happened to somebody else with something that's very similar to what <coughs> we're dealing with. Shouldn't we just be able to now proactively address this issue? Um, and I'm not quite sure where they are quite yet, but we certainly have the momentum now, and I think we're articulating it in a much more uh, effective way to capture attention for this and having the contract deliverable also be pushing at the same time. Or we're, hitting a, we're hitting a critical moment where it's now about identifying what does that actually look like um, because, as Tim said, STEP is a great idea, but it's not really realistic, especially I work with, within a firm that is, you know, at any one time they could be working on five projects as a person and not as a firm. But, um, but and so like that, that level of <coughs> chaos and hecticness, them to be able to then apply Kobe metadata <laughs> on a daily basis seems very unrealistic. And so we have to come up with some way, again, hint vendors, that um, we should 
the, the software should be able to account for this for them because it, just like Microsoft finally came and said, you know what, we're going to stop messing with it every two years so that you <coughs> can't have access to it in uh, forward and backward compatibility with massive data loss or corruption. And I, I hope that that's where we move in that direction so that there's just a little bit more safety and security in the files. Um, the, the concern really is about all this stuff that came before because we're at a, we're at a moment where we can help as a groundswell, shift it moving forward so that the software is better, but we still have to deal with all the crazy that happened before. And that's why we have Tim and Katie. Uh. <laughs> I do think that's an important distinction, though, and it's one we should keep in mind today, that there's sort of like, what are the best practices we can lay down moving forward, and how can we try to make it more likely that people will use IFC and you know document their workflows? And thinking about contract deliverables um, is a really you know, it's a really important factor in there. I think looking at Scandinavia, it's also very interesting that, you know, um, there are countries out there that are requiring BIM files, not just for the deliverables, but also for like competition entries. And it sort of changes how things work. Um, but, um, you know, in a, in a certain way, we have all this older stuff to deal with too. I think it's extremely um, interesting. Um, maybe it's because it's what I deal with the most. Um, but, um, but yeah, we do kind of need two strategies, um, at least. Um, and so we're almost talking about two, two separate things at that point. There are a lot of issues that continue, especially around file formats um, and their interoperability and their longevity. Um, but you know, the solution that we do for creative um, small design projects that never got built in like 1992 is gonna be a little different than the solutions that we have for like massive infrastructural projects in 2018. Um, and that's okay, but it means we're kind of talking about separate things sometimes. To have some continuity between them, hopefully, mm -hmm. <laughs> in the long term, from a historian's perspective. Yeah. <laughs> Hi, y'all. Thank you for a great overview. Um, so you're all practicing archivist, as am I. I'm wondering, um, in light of the many preservation challenges that you've outlined, um, what kinds of awkward or tough conversations about appraisal has this led to? Um, and if you feel comfortable offering examples, I'd love to hear about them. <laughs> <laughs> I'm actually a practicing librarian. I'm an archivist in librarian's clothing at the moment. Um, but I do have you know, interesting conversations about appraisal, not probably as much as these guys, um, but with one of my colleagues, Beth Dodd, at the Alexander Architectural Archive, and we discussed frequently some of these challenges, and I can't think of anything specifically off the top of my head, um, although we're currently, have been doing what a lot of people are doing, is, is not taking in a whole lot of things as of yet, and kind of hoping and waiting to see what will come. We have <coughs> gotten a few collections that have you know, a lot of digital media, and we've had, we've been working with students at the iSchool and, and bringing their sort of fresh eyes to these problems, um, but we are still kind of hoping for some ways to move forward. I, the argument I've been making for quite some time is that no one's going to find a solution. No one person is going to find a solution. No one organization um, is going to find a solution, and that's one reason we've all, we've been in conversation for quite some time, and I have with others in the room too, is I think we have to do this collaboratively um, and creatively to address both problems that Eliza and Tim just identified. Um, and I think that's the only way we're going to make any headway. Um, so that's my shtick, I guess. Well, and I was going to say, hilariously, we were literally talking about this at Coffee this morning. Like an hour ago. Yeah, yes. um, because, because the appraisal grid needs to be updated. Waverly and Tani have a wonderful book. If you haven't read it, you really should. Um, it's uh, uh, um, the, basically the architecture, <coughs> records, architecture and Construction Records Management book. It's great, and they have an appraisal grid in there that is wonderful, but is very focused on analog. And so the important thing we've been, I've been discussing with Waverly lately is how to update that because it's not that they're create, that designers are creating new records, uh, as in the, the construction process hasn't changed that dramatically. It's not now you offer like a like hologram of what you're producing. Um, but even then, like we still have plans, you still have illustrative uh, plans, you still have um, renderings and perspectives and elevations and details, all those things are still existing. It's just understanding what are the file types that are most likely gonna be the case and what does it mean to say keep forever versus, you know, I don't need your punch list for, like, after statute of limitations, like, punch list is not that necessary for me to hold on to. It could be terribly interesting for research, but, <laughs> um, but you know, making the decision of uh, the, the, 
what records we still need are consistent, but it's now changed because instead of saying you need the full set, you now say I want the central file for Revit and all of its extras, and I can't forget that there's a bunch of things that are connected to this file because if it's not packaged correctly, having the Revit central file and none of the families, like, so that would be like not having windows or walls or furniture, um, which are what families mm -hmm. are in, in Revit. So then you just kind of have like a box. Um, that, like, that, that's the kind of stuff that I think needs to be sussed out more. Um, and so the appraisal conversations I've had with people in my firm haven't gotten quite to that level yet because we're still waiting for our files to be old enough to need to be assessed that way. Um, but when talking to project teams, like it's really, there's, there's a difference between your working files and your deliverable and the deliverable is the thing that we're legally required to provide if something happens. And so making sure everyone everyone <coughs> in the room understands that, uh, going back to Kurt's point, of like the legal, the legal uh, requirements for the files is really important here. Yeah, I think there's a couple things to consider. One um, that may not be so obvious for the people who don't um, do sort of like digital preservation in the cultural sphere, um, is the significant overhead that goes into preserving files for the long term. It's like basically all of our digital preservation best practices require lots and lots and lots of replication of files. Um, so if we're talking to a donor and they're like, yeah, I want to give you everything that's on my servers and it's 10 terabytes, that in our underlying storage, when we account for the fact that formats are kept in their original format and also migrated to file formats that are more likely to be usable over the long term, and then all of those things are replicated across different media types and geographically repl replicated so that we don't have a single point of failure. We can do things like audit the files over time, restore them from backups if they change. All of that has a significant overhead and it's significantly expensive. So it means that we have to be more careful um, versus like a paper drawing that goes into um, a climate controlled fault. Um, I think it, uh, again, sort of just depends on the material, though. Um, part of it is also, like, I agree with Eliza that, you know, thinking about setting, um, updating the appraisal grid so that we can think about um, what's actually worth keeping is really important. Um, that there are a lot of things like externally referenced files and dependencies that you don't want to break. So that means that you have to know what you're doing when you're interacting with the material. But at the same time, with paper records, we never kept anything either. It's sort of the difference between being an archivist and being a hoarder. Is like you identify the things that have permanent value and you keep those, but we don't need to keep every draft of everything. We don't need to. So this yeah. diagram that Eliza showed, um, it's big, it's complex. It doesn't mean that we have to keep everything that's ever been created in perpetuity, especially in this world where things are like more networked, the files are bigger. So I think we have a lot of critical reflection to do about that. And it's really good to have a standard like the appraisal grid. I also think it just depends on yeah. your institution. Like, who are your researchers and what are they going to be doing? Um, if you want to make sure that you have plans around, PDFs might be fine. If you want to make sure that people can go in and reuse the data, then you're going to have to keep something a lot heavier. Um, so it all really sort of depends. Um, I will say for the old stuff, our strategy largely through um, a project called Archaeology of the Digital that the CCA did with Greg Lynn um, over a period of about five years was basically to identify the key projects that we thought were interesting and innovative from the early days um, and go grab everything. Um, but that's a lot more feasible when everything is a computer that's been sitting in someone's closet for a while. Um, or like, you know, I think the largest one is probably about 500 gigs. A lot of them are like 10 gigs. Um, so there we can just kind of go in and vacuum everything up. And I think for the old stuff, we kind of need to do that when we have the chance because um, collectively, collecting institutions should have been doing this for like 10 or 15 years by now and it's um, kind of close to, to too late for some of it. Like the media is already degrading, people already retired, moved on, whatever. Um, for the newer stuff, we have to be a lot more careful. Um, like, because when we talk to donors now, yeah, usually the assumption at the beginning on their part is that we'll want everything because we're collecting the total archive. Um, but we can't afford that, it's not feasible. I don't think it's good for our researchers to just present them with like, you know, 700,000 files. Um, no matter how you index it, th that's not gonna be helpful to anybody. Um, so, yeah, but just, it's a work in yeah. progress. Yeah, just to add a little bit more, I, I agree with these guys, but this is where, um, I also have been having a lot of conversations with a lot of different people, including some people in firms and colleagues elsewhere, and. I just like the idea of, of getting it out there to some extent that everyone's always appraising their stuff all the time. Um, you know, 
long before it gets to the point of a curator and archivist actually having that conversation with someone, decisions have been made in a firm um, about records that have implications for whether we can save it at all. And so there is some sort of education or, or conversations I want, I want to be having with architects to think about how they're keeping their own things, what has value in, in the way that they're doing their work, and that can inform what we choose to take on um, later on. And I think it is very context specific. Like I think it's going to be different in different places, both what firms you're looking at or you know who, who, what individuals, and also the collecting repository. And so I think there's also some opportunities for thinking across um, repositories how we might be doing this kind of work. And, and what we're capturing about the built environment generally um, doesn't have to be the same in all cases, but it, it, it should be able to speak to each other in some ways. Yeah. So thank you, Katie, Eliza, and Tim for our wonderful <laughs> kickoff for this morning, the history. I learned a tremendous amount of material myself. Um, we are right at 1020, and so now is the time for a morning break. Hello, I'm Christine Fallon, a moderator for this session. I'm a fellow of the American Institute of Architects. I've devoted my 40-year career to the topic of computer applications in design and construction. <laughs> I also did a very early study um, and proof of concept on collecting, archiving, and exhibiting digital design data for the Curatorial Department of Architecture at the Art Institute of Chicago. We have um, two presentations today. Our first speaker will be uh, Greg Schleusner, AIA. He's the Principal and Director of Design Technology Innovation at HOK. He is also Director of Building Smart in Initiatives for the BIM Forum and leader of the technical room within, the, within Building Smart International. Um, our second presentation was put together by Rick Zure, who's a technical principal at Boeing, involved in quality, CAD, CAM, CAI, industry data standards, and R&D. He co-chairs LOTAR International Consortium, developing aerospace data standards, and he represents <coughs> Boeing on related graded ISO initiatives. Unfortunately, <laughs> Rick isn't here. So uh, his, his presentation is being done by... Um, Phil Roche. Phil Roche, um, who's also involved in LOTAR. But first, uh, Greg Schleisner. Thank you. So uh, I'm gonna be, uh, we had a, a prep call for this, and uh, I thought the the comparisons and questions that came out of it were by far the most interesting. So, my presentation is really to set the stage of you know sort of making sure it's clear what we're doing today at HOK, uh, things we're thinking about. But uh, I think the meat of this discussion really comes from the interaction between those two things. I'm explaining why my presentation is so short. I'll put it that way. <laughs> uh, so a little bit about HOK. So. Uh, not only are we, you know, sort of a large architecture and uh, engineering firm, we showed up on that last set of uh, slides in the 70s and 80s. I, I would have to check, but I'm not certain if we ever actually sold a single seat of HOK Draw or Draw Vision, <laughs> which were the Unix-based and the Windows-based applications that we had. But in a previous life, and up until I joined HOK in 2008, 2010, we had people using these systems still internally because they liked them better than the other things we had access to. Um, so we do have a very interesting uh, problem ourselves with uh, um, archival data, but we were smart enough to make it interoperable with EWG a long time ago. Um, so HOK is, uh, like I'm showing on the slide here, uh, about 1,800 people. We work on pretty much everything save maybe um, industrial. It's probably the only thing I'm aware of that we don't do. Um, and we're spread about uh, four, 24 offices around the world. So uh, uh, thanks for the introduction. I like cats is the only thing I'll probably add on there. Uh, um, I actually don't own a cat, but uh, no, no, that's a secondary dis separate discussion. Uh, so I've been around at HOK for two th since 2008, which is uh, sort of a weird time to join a firm, uh, given the economy at the time. But uh, based on the uh, previous discussions, it was, you know, sort of made clear to me that we used to have a librarian, we used to have an archivist, but now we just have technologists, and we've not figured out how to, 
you know, sort of move past that and I actually think it's a very interesting part of the discussion. Um, okay, so it was very clear and I, I think the presentations helped uh, set the stage for this is we definitely think in projects. We don't think about a big strategy of uh, making sure we have continuum of information across projects. There's a lot of people that think that, oh, we did that detail on that project and that certainly does take place, but that's individual knowledge, that's personal knowledge, it's not something that's institu institutionalized or memorialized anywhere. Um, and frankly, the technologies don't exist to enable that in the first place. Um, and I think the, the key thing that was definitely made clear on the, uh, in the 2010s is this unique, unique production process. We often use the same tools project to project, but there's certainly no such thing as a standard uh, when it comes to what information is captured, how it, information is developed. We're very much a, a right tool for the project sort of a, a firm um, that certainly doesn't make it easy for us on the technology side to make it easier for the teams to interoperate between platforms. And actually, actually is a, uh, the linked discussion we're having here is the business drivers are starting to make sense for, for us to think about making data more interoperable and what are the things we need to, to start to do to, to do that. And that, to me, at least is a part of the discussion about how uh, an archival process could become easier. Because I'm uh, generally uh, sort of look to the, you know, sort of aerospace industries and others and, and I think the business drivers have made it easier to start to have these discussions right now where we're uh, unable to find those, uh, find the benefits without starting to think about those long term. Uh, so from a, just a general way of working, and I think uh, we can go in many directions with these, but 95% of our projects are model based. Um, we're moving to a global file system, so the reason I'm bringing that up is from a um, archiving as a res result of work strategy, we're moving to a system that will give us backups every 15 minutes in everybody else's minds that's perfect. I don't have to think about anything anymore. I just work and it's backed up and I have a million copies of stuff every time it's changed and it certainly will only get worse. Um, we're not, in a, for the big, big design and engineering firms, we're certainly not the first entity to start to do this, but the notion of, you know, every 15 minutes you have a snapshot of everything you did for perpetuity and that's sort of our uh, view of it. It's a short-term view, but that's definitely the way we're going. Um, the idea of archiving things just doesn't make sense to people. So it's, uh, well, we did the work, it's saved, I can go back in, in a slider and see where it was in time, whether you have the information around it that describes its state and which, you know, if it's, it's you know, 9.45 or 10 a.m. three years ago, who, who could possibly know? Um, we are starting to do the popular term in the industry is data lake processes, but some some approaches are to use data lakes and just take everything and put them somewhere, which is very much an archive. Uh, don't do anything before processing the data archive strategy. Um, because we're starting to see a business driver, and this is the piece that I'm most focused on, is a business driver to making the data interoperable or accessible. So. Simple example, we get asked by clients, we do hospitals, what is the OR look, uh, what do these ORs look like on the last 20 projects you've worked on? This is a three day intern question typically. Um, that should be a, you know, half hour uh, sit down in front of a computer and, uh, and uh, write a query question. But that question, uh, certainly we can have the um, uh, non-geometric -geo information but then you've disassociated with it, the actual design. So from a technology perspective, we're starting to look at tools that will actually allow us to ask that question and both get the geometric result and the information. And that's to us a very beneficial way of, you know, sort of as a firm that are our size, thinking about that sort of problem. So we can certainly go into that um, uh, further in the discussion. Um, and th that, uh, there's a question that always comes up because Building Smart or uh, HOK was one of the uh, original founders along with uh, others, Autodesk, uh, I'm blanking on a few others, Honeywell of uh, AIIAI, which became Building Smart, about whether or not our processes are 
ISC driven, you know, using these open tools. One of the things that we're finding is a lot of the processes don't result in the use of them. So we're starting to have that discussion as well about whether we need to be more proactive with the industry to make IFC part of that. So that's a, uh, it will, would come up in a question, so I may, just wanted to make sure I mentioned that. So last one, um, <laughs> I like cats. Um, and I, this is complete post-rationalization. I just like this one. But particularly, I have a, a technique I use in presentations, which is actually just combine the, the topic of the slide with the word cat. And you search the internet, you can always find a result. There's, <laughs> there's actually an image-based result. Um, and this one in particular was obviously laser scanning cats. Um, <laughs> but it's a very meaningful, it's actually, you know, in the, in the where we are thinking about going and within Building Smart and starting to get back into HOK, the concepts around linked data and semantic web technologies as a means to help describe this context. One of the most often used linked data concepts is cat is an animal, you know, sort of the diagram. So that's, a, like I said, a very good post-rationalization. So I'm going to stop there, and we'll go <coughs> on to the next presenter, and uh, we'll have a nice conversation. Thank you. Um, I'm Phil Roche. I'm, I'm standing in for Rick Zare. I have worked with Rick for, I don't know, probably 20 years or so. Um, first, I have to mention to you, though, if you feel a rumbling, it's not an earthquake. It's my stomach. So, <laughs> um, Something that Eliza had mentioned earlier, she had mentioned a problem that Airbus had had with their uh, computer-aided design system, uh, Katia from Dassault, and uh, the billion-dollar some mini billion dollar problem that it caused and um, Airbus is one of my customers as is Boeing as well obviously. Um, there were other surprising things regarding the, the A380 aircraft uh, Joe and I used to work with who worked at Pratt & Whitney who was the engine partner on the A380. Um, one day he calls me he goes they had the first A380 test flight today. And I was going great everything went all right. He goes yeah he says, and the, the plane was only 20 tons overweight. That, that was, here, here we are, you know, the computer-aided design and manufacturing generation, and the aircraft was 20 tons overweight. And I was going, it even took off? He goes, oh, of course it did. He says, you know, there's, there's lots of room for error. <laughs> and it, 20 tons, you know? How many cars is that? It's just a lot of cars. But anyway... Despite that we're in the digital age, um, and the, the example of the, uh, the wiring harness snafu at, at Airbus, uh, using the same CAD system at two different locations and having, having problems is, is still pretty typical. Um, I think my message today is, has to do with interoperability through the use of standards. Um, the primary standard we use, not the only standard, but one of the primary standards we use in, in aerospace and defense is the ISO STEP standard. Um, and I'm going to talk about two use cases today. Uh, one has to do with collaboration uh, between partners and Pratt and & Whitney and Airbus are partners, and then also between OEMs and their suppliers. Um, so I guess. Um, we're, uh, you all have probably seen the model-based enterprise uh, pyramid before. Uh, you know, we, we've changed it to fit our uh, particular uh, mode of operation. Um, from an archival standpoint, the main th three things there are the, uh, the information requirements and business rules, uh, the process and systems, and the uh, repository, uh, the retention period and the format. Um, one thing that's very important in the A&D industry to archive, and is, is, well, I'll just go ahead and say it, and then I'll talk about it a little bit, but is design intent. And uh, design intent takes many different forms. Um, you know, some of them are 
relatively easy to digitize, like geometric dimensions and tolerances, what we call product manufacturing information today. Um, you know, may, maybe some of the systems engineering data, uh, maybe some parametrics in the model, things of that nature. And, and, and others aren't quite so easy to, to digitize and then, and then archive or pass on to one of your partners. So the aerospace industry, just, just like the, the building industry, has, has very complex products. Um, you know, they, they have, you know, a simple product only has thousands of parts. A complex part product has tens of thousands of parts, maybe a million. Um, but as the products get more complex, um, it also becomes more complex on, on how do you retain that data for many years down the road. I, I don't know if I like the, the title of this slide or not. I, I would have called it just an interesting slide. But um, <laughs> you, have the, you have the various Boeing aircraft programs across the top there, the 767, the 747, the 77, the 777, and the 787. And uh, the, the top half of that chart kind of represents the as-designed view, and the bottom represents the as-manufactured view. And if you look at the numbers, I mean, look at the, the data volume and the as-designed and the as-manufactured, those are significantly different numbers. Um, one other thing I'll, I'll point out is that, you know, you're looking at the parts per airplane there, and you go, well, uh, why, why did it go down from the 777 to the 787 anyway? And that's because the more use of composite parts in the later aircraft, so that, that causes it to, be down, to go down. Um, one last thing on this, and this, this has to do with the complexity of managing data. And th this is a general comment, but up until 2005, um, the amount of data that had been created in the world was, was something on the order of 500 billion gigabytes. And very soon, probably maybe, maybe we are now, we'll be creating that much data every 10 minutes in the world, so. Um, early example of, uh, <coughs> of data exchange, the Rosetta Stone, uh, the same information in, in, in three different languages. Uh, evolving technologies, uh, and, and this, this is kind of aerospace-centric, but uh, Something I'm going to throw in, throw in here is the, uh, the, the requirement by the FAA to provide the, the type design data to them or, or to retain it for long periods of time. And the first generation was the engineering drawing uh, and, and the, the authority or the, to the F, for the FAA was the, the 2D drawing. We're kind of in the end of the second generation right now. Um, you know, we, we are in a 3D world. Um, we were talking last night that um, the, the production folks tend to still be in the 2D world. Um, and, and I see a lot of my customers, company like a, a Rockwell Collins or a Honeywell, uh, when they provide data to one of their suppliers to manufacture it, they'll, they'll provide them both a, maybe a step file or a CAD model and a 2D drawing. Uh, but anyway, we're, we're certainly moving toward that 3D world, and, and, and we are in discussion with the FAA about a 3D authority for this data. Something else that's, that's very important to us in the A&D inter industry is controlling that product data. And, uh, you know, we used to be configuration management based, which is, you know, somewhat paper based. Uh, you know, it was, it was kind of haphazard, really. Uh, the engineering intent or the design intent was in multiple locations. Uh, we moved on to product data management, uh, which was really a file-based uh, notion. Uh, 
you know, the engineering intent or the design intent was still in multiple locations. Uh, and, and now we're more moving into more of a product lifecycle management uh, scenario, which is more of a relation-based system. And uh, one nice thing about this is that we can gather all the design intent into one location. Having to do with product life cycles, um, and, and you know, different industries have different timelines regarding this. Um, typically, point releases of software upgrades are probably every three to six months. Um, you know, major releases are one to two years, uh, maybe a little longer. Computer processes are changing all the time. Um, people are coming and going at the company. Uh, I kind of find, found that hard to believe, the one that's marked careers there at five years. And it's going, why would somebody want to leave a company like Boeing? I mean, you know, great benefits, great pay, all that kind of stuff. And I looked it up, and sure enough, it was 4.6 years was the average turnover at Boeing, which I found kind of amazing. But um, the design, uh, talking about the, the need for archival in the A&D industry, Look at the B-52, the, the design of that started in the, the late 40s. Uh, we're still flying it today. I don't really see it going away anytime soon. Uh, and and we, we have other commercial and defense uh, products that, that are in that, that same life cycle. 707 is an example. They're still flying. Um, From the collaboration standpoint, Boeing, as are a lot of uh, companies, and it's not just an aerospace thing, obviously. I mean, look at BMW. They make cars all over the world. Uh, and oddly enough, the largest BMW manufacturing facility is in South Carolina, where I live. And, and I heard that, and I was going, that's just amazing. The largest BMW facility in the world is in South Carolina. But um, Boeing's a 24-hour operation due to their, their global uh, nature. Uh, they have hundreds of partners, and, and we use the term partner to mean like a Pratt & Whitney or a GE or a Rockwell or a Honeywell. And then they also have thousands upon thousands of suppliers, you know, that they may make one little bracket or something. So uh, anyway, um, there's certainly a need for a kind of a standard way of communicating among all these partners and suppliers uh, due to the global nature of Boeing. So INSTEP's uh, the LOTAR project here, and actually this is kind of the introductory part to it, but um, we work with a number of different organizations. Uh, we obviously work with the, the ISO uh, to create the standards. Um, we, we work with a, a company, or not, an organization, excuse me, SASIG, uh, who has a product data quality uh, project going on. Um, one thing that is very important in the A&D industry when you talk about archival is the ability to, to verify and validate it before you archive it, and also the ability to verify and validate it as you're retrieving it. And um, as an example of that, I had mentioned that, you know, kind of a cornerstone for us are the ISO step standards. Um, they didn't really have much verification and validation stuff in them. Uh, we, we've extended the data models that we use considerably. And uh, I would imagine that about 25% of the, uh, the physical files that we write out in the step format today are just have to do with verification and validation of the data that's in the file. So, like I said, this is very important to the, uh, the aerospace industry. Um, I, I talked about the model-centric data management, the model-based enterprise a little earlier. NIST is, is certainly one of our partners in all of this, and, and I think they've been very heavily involved with uh, IFC and, and BIM over the years as well, probably some of the same people that we deal with. So. Uh, it's kind of a global community um, that's working on this, not, not just um, you know, the Boeings and the Airbuses and the Lockheeds of the world. 
low tar project. Um, boy, where to start on this? I, you know, I'm going to skip this slide. I don't like it. <laughs> this is, remember, this isn't my presentation, so. These are the, you know, the tip, I'm not going to spend any time on this, the typical kind of questions you, uh, you ask about, you know, when you're getting ready to archive data, you know, the, the when and the what and the, all those kinds of things. Um, this is a timeline of, of the LOTAR project or program. Uh, in the late 90s, there, there were independent efforts uh, in the Americas and in Europe having to do with uh, long-term preservation uh, you know, for aerospace and defense. Um, the next key date on that it happened down there in 2009. <coughs> Excuse me. We started a funded project, the LOTAR project, uh, between uh, the AIA and the ASD. It's a different AIA, too, by the way. Why is there two, anyway? <laughs> Confusion. Which one came first? Ours. <laughs> <laughs> My understanding was Wilbur Wright. Um, we predate Wilbur Wright. Oh, yeah, I guess you do. <laughs> anyway, uh, 2009, we started the funded LOTAR program. Um, talk, talk a little bit more in a minute about how we work. Uh, we've been spinning off work groups to work in specific areas that are of importance in the A&D industry. Um, and I, I'm going to touch on that. A little later. Um, another kind of cornerstone for us is the OAIS uh, uh, reference model for the low tar processes. I'm sure you all are, some of you are, are intimately familiar with that. Um, and, and as the basis of that, as I said earlier, we use the, the, the ISO 10303 step standard. Um, the work groups that we currently have in low tar. Uh, the newest one, engineering analysis and simulation, uh, wiring harness. Who do you think uh, drove wiring harness anyway? Mm. <laughs> it was Airbus. But uh, metadata for archive packages, 3D visualization. Oh my goodness, I don't know if I can do it. Uh, composites, advanced manufacturing, mechanical, and, and product data management or PLM. And this is just kind of a mapping between the various work groups uh, in the blue there in the middle. That is blue, isn't it? I'm colorblind. Yeah. Uh, are the LOTAR parts that correspond to it? The LOTAR parts kind of talk about what needs to be archived and how to archive it. And then the uh, corresponding ISO standards down there at the bottom. Uh, you, you can take a look at the uh, LOTAR homepage at your leisure. Um, the impact of interoperability, and then this is primarily from the, I'd call it the design and collaboration standpoint, but um, delivering models to the customer using different systems, uh, that costs an additional 53% or, you know, causes a cost increase of that. Uh, supplier communication, uh, you know, all those things cause the price of a product to increase. And, and you know, you look at the price of a, a, a 787 and, or an A380, and that's just considerable. These, these are based are on some data that NIST uh, had collected a couple years ago. We have these charts, too. <laughs> it's throughout industry. Um, benefits of using the low star standard, uh, process security uh, through use, using uh, international standards and uh, uh, the aerospace and defense authorities uh, accept the workflows, the type authority, um, based upon our, our process and the way we store data and what the format of the data. Um, the, the bottom point there, uh, the bottom bullet, um, LOTAR is kind of a funny thing, at least to me. Um, you solve a lot of the problems of, of data exchange and data sharing uh, through the use of, of long-term archival techniques. They, they share a lot of the same aspects. Gee, and I thought I had one more slide, but I don't. But anyway, that's my last slide.
So we're moving right on to the second section. This is um, a follow-on to what we were just heard, where we're going to hear from th three different perspectives on some of the specific issues in the data uh, timeline in terms of the work that is done in different kinds of firms and at the GSA. And we have some questions to prompt the discussion. And I'll start with questions. Um, I'll start with a question directed at one of our speakers, and then each of them will also have an opportunity to respond. We have with us uh, Noemi Lafoure de Bonny, who is at Valmori Associates. Um, I can say a couple of sentences about each person, but their bios are on the website as well. Noemi played a role in activating. Uh, BLA labs within Balmori Associates to further push the boundaries of architecture, art, and engineering. Green roofs, floating islands, temporary landscapes, forms of representation, zero waste city, and other things as well. Mark Rylander, in addition to the bio on the website, Mark is a solo practitioner with three active partnerships. He formed Rylander Hone Architects to design a friend school. He works with Carrie Moran, a AIA on residential projects, and he serves as an owner's representative on a large development project in Texas. He's also currently freelancing with a landscape and land planning firm in Charlottesville, Virginia. And Nick Jacali is a program manager and product owner at the General Services Administration, focusing on the implementation of IT systems that support GSA's role in design, construction, project delivery. Nick has been with GSA since 2003, serving as a project manager on complex construction projects for many years before transitioning into his current role. And I realized I should introduce myself. I'm Ann Whiteside. I'm the Assistant Dean um, and Librarian for Inch Information Services at the Harvard Library Graduate School of Design. I've been working on and thinking about issues related to preservation of digital design data for uh, a decade now, and I'm pleased to be participating in this symposium. So shall we get started? Sure. All right. I'm going to start with a question for Mark. Um, what are the challenges of design software on your firm's workflow and design processes? So as a, as a sole practitioner, um, every project is a little different. We, um, we figure out what we're going to do based on the client and the partners that we've put together for a given project. And, and make do with what we have. And, uh, a moment ago, I was trying to, watching uh, Phil's slides and thinking of what we possibly have in common with Boeing. Uh, and I looked up at the uh, 767 that was done with paper drawings and then down at my pencil, and I thought, yeah, we used to do that. <laughs> we could do that, too. Uh, but but uh, by and large, we, uh, our practices represent almost the whole history of software that, that that uh, anyone on our team has worked with, um, and and our work ranges from uh, using a lot of SketchUp that small uh, companies use uh, to uh, AutoCAD and VectorWorks uh, and rendering software. Um, I'll just stop there because there's there's so much I could say about the software that we use. The, techni the technical challenges you ask about really have to do with the complexity uh, and the and the purchasing agreements. So. You know, we generally have to buy subscriptions. We have to, uh, uh, you know, own a lot of different kinds of software simultaneously, and year by year, you you uh, have to uh, really buy more than you need. Uh, a lot of feature-laden um, uh, packages, like the Adobe Suite, where we only use pieces of it uh, to put together what we need for presentations. So, you know, what we what we would hope to see in the future is something that's uh, simplified and streamlined. <coughs> Do you want to take it up? I think there's also something that Eliza had started to discuss earlier, this idea of and the subscription base of every software. Um, we used to have those disks of uh, 3D uh, Studio Max and AutoCAD. And if for any reason we had to open an older file, we could always reinstall that copy. But now that everything is subscription based, if we have um, it's a case of 3D Studio Max. We no longer have a current version of the software at the office. If we need to open an older file, right. we are incapable of doing it, even though we created it and it's our information within that file. And 
this idea of 3D Studio Max was for um, a new city that we had designed in, uh, in Korea, and uh, the project was going to be put um, in an exhibition in uh, Los Angeles. And we were incapable of giving our own uh, product, which was extremely frustrating. Of course, we have um, the deliverables that um, you'd mentioned earlier. We have PDF and PowerPoint and whatever. But if, uh, in the case of the exhibitions, they wanted to do a 3D, printed 3D um, model of that city, and it was just impossible for us to see our own data. Yeah, a couple of thoughts from the GSA side. Um, we have two primary challenges kind of implementing design software and related software at GSA. One is that um, since we are a federal agency, all of our software that we purchase and that we put um, into our agreements with our contractors and our architects has to comply with federal IT security requirements, which can be quite onerous. Um, and so we're always balancing kind of giving our teams all the tools they need to get the job done, working with our contractors and our architects um, to kind of be open to software that they use, but also trying to comply with um, FedRAMP and FISMA as more and more applications go to the cloud. Um, you know, we're trying to work with the industry to make sure that those applications are working in alignment with our security requirements. The other thing that we run into a lot also is that um, since we're an agency that has regional offices across the country and we run about 10,000 projects a year, um, kind of every region is basically responsible for figuring out how, how to run their own project. And so getting the level of consistency in terms of inputs across all those project teams, across our contracts, um, is something that you know, we're always striving to do better at. Given what you've all just said, are there some um, compelling uh, some compelling needs at future software that um, would help your design processes and workflows? You know, one of the frustrations I've had just in terms of presenting, and I'm frustrated by the feedback here, uh, <laughs> is, is the, uh, the, the ability to, um, to present uh, in, in a fluid way to clients uh, on top of the drawings that we have. There's an increasing dependence on uh, telecommunication. And you want me to be closer to it? OK. And, you know, so, so it's, it's not uncommon even for a sole practitioner to, to have a video conference, and, and I think given the dependence on drawing, having uh, an integrated touchscreen application, I sort of see the future of the, the iPad Pro, like the Toshiba tablet I used to have where you can draw on top of your own drawings to present to a client, but do it in a really fluid way that's touch sensitive, and that kind of technology would be really valuable, I think. Uh, I've seen as it, as it relates to SketchUp to sort of incorporate uh, you know, some of the technology I've seen in, in Maya that General Motors uses where you can actually use your freehand drawing to carve away at the model would be really helpful. And so I've always imagined somehow being, to do, being able to do something like that on my own desktop. I think as an owner, we want you know, more integration between design software and kind of the rest of the ownership life cycle. Um, I work mainly in the project space, but obviously we have building maintenance, we have portfolio decisions that are being made. We do a lot with lease facilities too. And right now, kind of all of those things are a bit segmented in our model of things. So bringing that all together, either through integration or additional functionalities in software is something that we're eager to work on. Um. Something that was discussed earlier this morning too was um, processes and in our effort to prepare um, our archive to be sent to, to Yale University Library, it's something that is very important to us is how do we document the process? How did we get to that final phase in the design? And in Microsoft Word, you can track your changes uh, we don't have uh, HOK 15 minutes uh, backup system in our small practice, but having something ordering um, online um, go to meeting or some sort of uh, conference code where you can mark things up. There is no record of any of this, and maybe a software that would somehow help us document not only those final product and deliverable, but um, processes. 
would be interesting to us. <laughs> do you um, do you have somebody in your firm that or somebodies who are responsible for that for any documentation like that currently without the software that you're looking for? Um, so it's a very uh, we are preparing the, the, the archive and the legacy of uh, Diana Balmore, the founding principal in our firm that passed away a year ago. And we have started this process probably five, five years ago or so. And um, the archiving process of older projects is informing mm. the new projects that we are doing now and how we should keep record of them. But at the same time, we are a small firm, and we don't have a designated person to to arrange and organize all this data. So it's kind of left for all of us to do with a set of standards that are never really followed or naming <laughs> system. It is just too hard to mm -hmm. to to keep and uh, maintain. So we all do a little part. We all wear different hats and spend a couple of hours here and there. Uh, Mm -hmm. preparing those uh, those files to be sent to you. How does that work in, in your firm, Mark? Well, uh, on slightly larger projects or more so for more sophisticated clients, you know, our archiving process uh, that, that tends to be a PowerPoint, uh, having a sequential story that begins as a storyboard in the office and ends up being, the, you know, the best way to explain how you got to where you did kind of simultaneously uh, presents the work you put together and, and records the thoughts that went into it. You can throw sketches into the inside and it also kind of documents that a phase is complete. So, you know, often uh, a really well thought out PowerPoint, uh, you know, provides a kind of closure that a big rolled up set of drawings doesn't uh, because, it, because it forms this record of design and intent as a, as a story. And, but the only thing that would improve on that would be, you know, I think we all come up against some of the, the fundamentals of operating systems like just opening images in Windows and, and the ability to kind of quickly scroll through images. So, I, you know, I would love to be able to have software like Portfolio, that alias Portfolio Wall that, uh, that alias now Autodesk has where you can, you can pull out the images and arrange them on a desktop and not open a folder because the more organized you are in archiving and putting things in folders the harder it is to figure out where was that great image which meeting was that that we remember that sketch we did and which which presentation was it in oh it was in 17 11 15 <laughs> under bar you know client presentation 3 and i think it was in the middle and by that time you know you get a phone call and you and you and you've you're unable to sort of connect back to the original idea so so getting, getting access to images really quickly and sorting through them remains, you know, as was a dream in, in the, the origin of Windows, it still remains something that's a little out of reach for all of us. Interesting. Nick, do you want to talk about that a little bit? Sure. At a project level, we try to collect everything that's produced by our product teams. And I think we've taken the strategy to kind of worry about how to get to the access of that data later. Um, but for the design phase, I mean, we kind of collect every um, iteration of the formal design submissions that are specified in our contracts. Um, once we get to construction, our existing enterprise product management tool is built to collect all RFIs and submittals that are generated on the project, um, as well as any reports and other correspondence that happens during the course of a project. So right now at product level, we're trying to track all that throughout every phase of the project. I think our bigger issue is after that product is over, you know, how does that stuff get maintained? Does it get maintained well? Somebody mentioned earlier about having to, you know, what's the right level of detail to have people um, enter data related drawings or, or others, you know, artifacts. And we struggle with that a lot because, you know, resource wise, our building managers are probably managing 40 plus products at a time while also taking care of their building. So they don't have time to kind of when a paint color changes or or something else to update that in the BIM file. So, you know, what do you do with all of that data that you need but don't have the resources to, to manage? 
You've each talked a little bit about um, standards, and I'm wondering if we can draw some more out about standards and how what the role is of external guidelines or standards or um, vendor neutral file formats have in your workflow, um, and why they're and if they're challenging, how they're challenging. If we could draw out a little bit more about that. I don't know. Do you want to start? Sure. Um, so maybe I could start by introducing the process uh, in the office. So Eliza spoke again a little bit about it, but uh, in the schematic design, again, not every project is the same, but uh, in most cases, the schematic design phase, um, concept design phase, in the landscape field, uh, we're going to want to work in uh, 3D, and we are most likely going to be using um, Rhino to think about um, the different slope and berms and recessed areas. Um, after we've started to think about volume, and that's the sort of file that we'll exchange with architect, um, that file is very easy. It doesn't need to be packaged. All the information is contained within that file, so it's very easy to share. Um, after that, when we move into the design development and uh, construction document, it's at that moment that we're going to go into the 2D and start documenting our design in um, AutoCAD. Um, at that moment, we are going to start using, um, we're going to set uh, the files um, with uh, following the format of the deliverable. Uh, each of those files um, is like in the paper format is this one sheet. And within that sheet, we are going to um, link in or to add some um, X ref, which are uh, reference to other files of that same AutoCAD format. Um, and we are going to be able to work on that sheet file and on those XREF uh, file with multiple people being able to touch at different files. Um, as landscape, for example, if we do uh, a project with an architect, we are going to add their um, building as an XREF to our file. If at the end of this process we do not uh, package this uh, file, we are going to lose all the different linked files to it. Or in our office, all the files are saved on the servers, and the server is um, backed up in two different locations, on the East Coast and the West Coast, and we can get copies. Of, I think we are saving three copies a day um, of those files. When the project is sort of done, we move it into what we call the archive uh, partition of our server. And in moving files, um, and that, uh, that archive partition is not backed up as often. When we move those files, if we did not package them, then we're going to have to spend um, pretty, uh, you know, 10, 15 minutes, maybe even more, trying to search those linked files to be able to have. I'm so sorry, it's very complicated. <laughs> but it's just, uh, it's, it's what we need to to do and we often, um, because we have working on 10 different projects and there is always one deadline after another deadline, we often uh, forget that one step and then we regret it when 10 years later the project is back on track and we have to find those original uh, files. Mm -hmm. That all sounds very familiar to me since one of the most recent projects I've been working on uh, is, is with a landscape firm collaborating with uh, with other freelancers and it's interesting to see just it's kind of a miracle in a way how a group of people who haven't really met each other managed to coordinate uh, a site plan in a landscape architecture firm without having a manual and it's very complex because the, su the survey will come in with all of its layers and you'll create these external references from maybe a Google Earth image that you put in on, a, on one layer and the GIS uh, information that sh shows uh, county boundaries for, for sensitive areas and steep slopes. And by the time you're ready to draw a rectangle for where the building goes, you've got a really, really complex file and the way you even edit any part of it involves uh, 
a lot of, of, of care. And if someone comes in and is in a little bit of a hurry and puts one of those references in a folder, or worse yet, somebody who's really into filing systems and thinks that the names of things should be different, and you change the name of an image that, it's true with the Adobe products too, you're in the image folder and you change the name of an image to give it a little more clarity instead of scan32, it becomes, you know, barn. And suddenly it's, it's unlinked and no one can find it and it doesn't come out in your presentation. So it's a very, it's a very, very methodical process that, that many of us you know, became designers because we weren't really that methodical to start out with. And so we've, we've, had, to, we've had to learn how to, uh, to be really methodical. And I, I almost, I picture it, it's like the, uh, Daniel Kahneman's book, Thinking Fast and Slow, that you might have read. I feel like as designers, we're in this sort of system one and everything's intuitive and we're shooting from the hip. And then when it comes time to make sure our external references are all filed correctly, we have to be really methodical. Yeah, at GSA we try to stay away from dictating how um, designers manage the CAD files and how they construct um, the drawings that they're working on. We do have, obviously we're a large federal bureaucracy, so we have lots of standards and guides that are out there. Um, P100 kind of dictates all of our requirements around um, construction and design requirements and also some deliverable requirements. We do have a BIM guide that's out there that helps to define kind of if we are using BIM on a project, what the final deliverables have to comply with and stuff like that. But a lot of the time, you know, again, we're dealing with thousands of contractors, thousands of architects. So we try to stay out of the how you do the job part of it and just try to kind of manage the end product by our contracts and specifying, you know, what those deliverables need to look like. Are there other aspects of your workflow that um, you think are helpful to this Conversation and thinking about standards and and uh, software that we've talked about this morning. Um, and sort of, um, I mean, it's parallel to the design process, but in preparing for the um, documents to be sent to to Yale, something that we we think is very important is writing a narrative, which is a little bit similar to the PowerPoint uh, that Mark was describing, but uh, that will tell you, oh, well, in 2006, there was the, yeah, this huge economic crisis, so yes, the budget had to be cut, so we had to redesign. That's why there are two designs for that same space. And this takes a little bit of time, but it's not, it maybe takes a couple of hours. It's not, uh, a crazy amount of time as renaming files or packaging them, but I think for anyone that would want to go very much into the project and research it, it will at least give them some sort of direction of how to navigate this nebulous of uh, files. From a collections viewpoint, I really like that. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, one of the challenges that sole practitioners face, and we, we all face, is a sort of movement towards design build, which can mean a lot of different things depending on whether it's, you know, a house addition or, you know, a major master plan that uh, has, is a fast track construction project. So, but, but, but in e either of those, uh, the initial design brief is really important. And, and you know, as I looked at the slide, uh, earlier about that with all the energy management software, you know, one can make a statement that we would like uh, this project to be 30% below ASHRAE 90.1 and whatever year it is or to meet a certain lead standard. And then, but, but how to actually get there, uh, there are many, many pathways and that software is, you know, a lot of it is really experimental. So this design brief, kind of like the PowerPoint, I imagine it being not unlike, you know, Boeing's design brief, there's all this technical stuff that you need to meet that's non-visual, that the drawing doesn't represent, uh, that are performance standards that you hope to meet or are required by GSA to meet, for example. So, you know, the, 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 the real, uh, you know, one of the things that's very hard to document is the, the pathway by which these non-visual standards are met, and it's usually some other kind of paper trail, and it may be solved in, in some form of BIM. Certainly, I would love to be able to, 
and, and, and hope to soon be able to click on a part of the drawing uh, and, and come up with a Word document that, or an Excel spreadsheet or some other type of file or chart or graph that references you know, why something is a certain way. Cause, because otherwise, the, you know, explaining to somebody retroactively why the building doesn't meet that energy standard and what happened along the way and that kind of finger pointing uh, is is pretty common. Uh, it's a pretty common sight. Yeah, my only other comment on that, when I think of workflow, one of our primary challenges as an owner is, you know, we have usually hire, especially for our larger projects, you know, design firm, we usually hire a separate contractor, we usually hire a CMA or somebody to help kind of oversee it, and then, you know, we might have other contracts commissioning agents you know, we're involved on a product management basis. We're dealing with customers and all sorts of other stakeholders. So in terms of workflow from design through that whole process of a project, how do you get all those people collaborating the right way in a system or in a set of systems or other methods to produce um, kind of the results that you want? And our experience with that has honestly not been great. Since 2009, you know, we've had an electronic product management system at GSA that was kind of intended to do all of that and you know some teams have gravitated towards it more and, and use it for project collaboration and workflow so if somebody submits a drawing it gets approved in there if somebody submits an RFI the formal response is recorded there and all that kind of stuff um, but many of our projects are still kind of working in terms of workflow and collaboration outside of that tool with other technologies that have evolved since then so it's trying to find kind of the medium or the middle ground between you know what do we mandate or what do we have in a collective system or set of systems versus, you know, how does that workflow happen outside of it? Um, another area that um, I think you touched on was um, accessing legacy data and some of the, and you've learned from accessing your legacy data what you should do in the future. Um, are there other thoughts about that that we could learn about from each of you or what you would do differently as you have had experiences unable to access legacy data? Well, there, yeah, I'm, I'm reminded that, that you know, I know this conference is largely about software and, and we were talking about wish lists. Uh, a lot of times our legacy data is actually a set of drawings and sketches, uh, but increasingly, uh, you know, because it's easy to store, having record uh, photographs, uh, you know, it's easy to get a point cloud of the existing building and a lot of, a lot of that kind of data that, uh, uh, I, but I, I think, you know, what it, what it would be helpful uh, for us in our, in our tiny office would be to have a really great printer and scanner and a lot of other stuff that we can't really afford that would just simply allow us to digitize a lot of the documents that are not, are not fully digital. And, and I, you know, I, I, I almost feel like there could be, and probably is a way to partner with the, some of the more sophisticated printers to uh, have an, an archiving, probably, a, you know, a simple PDF archiving standard. Um, the other kind of data I was talking about with the energy stuff might be a lot harder to figure out. Mm -hmm. Yeah, our issue with uh, accessing legacy data, so I kind of mentioned it, I think, earlier, is that, you know, we have many different business lines at GSA um, and kind of IT investments over time because of the size of our agency have largely been business line driven. And so currently we have an IT environment that has building drawings over here. We have kind of a system that takes care of work requests. So if a light bulb goes out, you know, there's a flow process there that gets taken care of. We have a product management system, which I described earlier. We have a portfolio investment um, system we have another system that we use for um, charging rent to the other federal agencies that are inhabiting our space. So we have these drawings um, that have kind of come online. We're storing them in all these systems at least for the last five years. And so how are we, if I'm starting a new project, you know, am I going to five different systems to get the inputs to start that project? Am I now trying to tie all these things together so I can you know, have a better cohesive model? So. I think as we're looking at our IT expenditures going forward, trying to be more strategic in how we bring those that have been historically separate business units and systems you know, together to flesh out a more cohesive 
story about a building and, or a, a project or set of projects. I, I had one other thought, if I could just chime in, and that, that just has to do with the, you know, the trend in, in our time towards uh, just more and more sophisticated images of buildings. Architecture is not an image, it's a three-dimensional construct, and I was just thinking about some of the projects that I would love to be able to, I'd love to be able to look at the Form Z models of some old projects from my former office and actually rotate the design development Form Z model because there was a lot going on, and when I look back, look at what's in my portfolio, it's the rendering that we sent out, and somebody did a great rendering of the front of the building, but there's all this really great work that often, often what the Library of Congress should have is the, the high, high resolution model uh, before a lot of the compromises happen in the later phases of the building and during construction. So that you, you know, it, that's the one you would want to show. You don't want to show the one where, you know, you've, you've had to value engineer out the wall panels and the awnings go away and the sunshades go away and suddenly everything gets very flat and everything that, you know, all of the compromises that are made along the way. But usually somewhere around design development, there is uh, the design intent sort of reaches its highest level and then it starts to drop off. And, and that historically has been uh, a point where the, the best modeling software available at that time is used and now I don't have no idea how you go back, uh, how you go back and, 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 uh, and retrieve that. I hope you. I hope you figure it out. Yeah, everybody's pointing at Tim. It's all up to Tim. <laughs> I just wanted to share an experience yes. during the archiving process. At one point, early on, we decided that we would create um, PDF of the uh, AutoCAD file at specific important moments in the design process that were not recorded by the deliverable. They were more like internal meetings that sanctioned. Uh, direction into the design. And we did it for a whole project. And we looked back at those files and the line weight or the way they were translated in PDF did not reflect the design. I mean, every element was there, but you couldn't read it. Um, and after that uh, experience, we stop transforming files. So whatever format they are in, that's the format we send them to Yen. <coughs> I'm thinking now we might want to move into Q&A and invite Christine and her speakers back up to the podium so we can have a conversation with the audience. So we're handling this as a combined Q&A, so it's a free-for-all. Um, <laughs> who has a question for anyone? <laughs> You need a uh, mic. Hi, I'm Eliza Leventhal from Sasaki. Um, and my question is really to all of you in terms of, I, we've talked a little, you guys talked in the second panel about um, like your hopes and dreams of what would be great to have. Um, but I think what I'm would be interested in, in talking about is more what is a reasonable standard for like, what is something like Naomi? You mentioned that uh, Naomi. That you, you mentioned that you guys have standards and they don't always get upheld. I can relate to that. Um, but uh, the the what what is reasonable then? How can is it something that needs to be a button in Revit in order for that to make or you know all these various software can just be Revit? But like, does every software need to have like perfect archive function? And that's the answer because that's not reasonable. But what would be something that you'd be like you can imagine being built into your workflow, um, in term, in terms of like, making sure things are accessible. You know, I, I suppose one one thing that that would be that it's interesting that sometimes when we send a, a, a digital file out, we like to send a PDF so that we know exactly how it should look when it plots. So I'm not sure if your question is sort of asking what would what would the standard, what would an office standard be or a, a digital standard, but I think to the extent that um, it's, it's sometimes unclear whether or not someone on the receiving end is going to be able to, to 
view or plot a drawing the way it's intended, uh, that, that some type of metadata that says that, you know, all of the lines that are magenta should plot at 0.35 millimeters, for example, that they, there's actually like a, some type of graphic interface, because we have it in the office. In the office we have, have a, little, uh, a little card that shows which colors plot at which, at which line weight. So it's, it's always kind of funny in the sophistication of a digital uh, environment, you still have cheat sheets on scraps of paper that tell you which colors plot at which size, depending on what your plot file is that you've used. So somehow that connection between the design intent of the lines and how they should appear graphically seems to be part of the file system that's needed. Kind of basic. I don't think that's completely unrealistic, but I'm not really sure about discussion with uh, industry uh, partners, but a read-only um, file would be quite interesting when you no longer own the copy of the software, but you could still just look at that file, not modify anything in it, just turn the model around, look at different uh, elevation. Maybe that's not too far. Greg, off. do you have some thoughts on that? Uh, I don't know. I, the answer to the question is a, a tough one because simply, uh, if if uh, if there's not a business purpose for doing it, it's always a tough sell, right? <laughs> so I, I'm, you know, sort of a, a market. Uh, my 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 thing is this is a market-based solution. So you sort of, you have to figure out what's valuable and that's what will become useful. So, you know, there's these. Uh, you know, certainly we have contract deliverables and so forth, but uh, at the end of the day, a lot of the standards are for moving between two parties. But if you don't have a standard that you ever use while you do your work, it's not valuable to you to do the thing that you have to hand to the next person. So that that uh, somewhere in the, is is my thinking. I don't know exactly what that looks like because that basically basically implies that you'd have to get vendors to work on open formats, which is not the way they currently want to view the world. But. I, it would seem to me that the one of the big ideas we're going to get to after lunch is is access use cases. In other words, what is it you're trying to archive? Is it you know the 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 essence of the design at its you know most refined point? Um, is it what we told the contractor to build? You know what is it you're trying to archive? And then you have um, kind of different requirements and then different methods. It would seem to me. I don't know. Uh, Phil? Well, I'm not going to answer what you said or address that, but I, I will kind of answer what I think your question was. Um, and actually, it's something that I'm talking about after lunch. It's, it's my presentation this time, but anyway, um, <laughs> we, we have a uh, implementer forum for, for software producers that write to the, the, the standard format. And you know, we started doing this like back in the 90s and, and some of the software developers started to write step interfaces, but they didn't necessarily communicate or interoperate with the other software developers' step interfaces. And so, you know, multi-trillion dollar problem here. So industry had, had asked us to, well, how do, how, do you, how do you test for interoperability? Hmm. And so, you know, we, we thought about it and some colleagues of mine from Ford and Boeing and General Motors and other companies got together and we, we came up with, you know, kind of a testing scenario and we've refined it over the years. But, you know, I, I think there's a lot of instances where there's a standard thrown out there and they go, okay, go, go implement it. But it's really not that easy to implement, you know, and, you know, one vendor might you know, go in path A and another vendor go in path B and, you know, there goes your interoperability right there. So I, I think my answer to your question is, is that there has to be some forum for software companies to test their products and, uh, you know, non-adversarial forum, if you will. So we could go on a long time on this question. Are there any others? Is there one over there? Yep. Hi. You're hiding behind the column. I see you. Okay. Okay. Um, I've, Noemi, I have a question for you. Um, 
Oh, I'm sorry, I'm Kurt Helfrich again from the National Gallery of Art. So Noemi, I just wanted you, a comment, something you told us struck me, which was basically this idea that at a certain point you had thought about creating PDFs of some of the drawings. And could you just elaborate a little bit more on that? In other words, were they, they were actually PDFs of CAD or sort of board digital materials. Um, one of the things that Alex Ball has done in his white paper on CAD is to say, you have to understand why you're collecting things. So if you're collecting things for image value, for instance, PDFs or TIFFs are fine. But if you're doing it for other things, then you really need to think about the native formats. But I'm actually really struck. I'd like to hear more about what you found that was missing in those PDFs that, that you're aware of. Um, if we go, if I try to explain it from the, um, doing it analog, we would have done to go to a meeting and discuss different alternatives. We would have sketched out different things on trace paper and we would have had different layers and maybe we would have put them on top of one another and we would have you know, been able to remove one layer, change color, highlight something and whatnot. And then if we were to send that analog piece to Yale, we could just send all of those layers and that would have been the documenting that moment in the design process where we were making, I don't know, decision about the size of a berm, the height, I don't know, something. If we put this in digital, um, we would have done maybe the same sort of exercise, uh, you know, drawing in CAD those different curves and they would have been on different layers and when presenting them we would have shown, or maybe plotting them, we would have shown them on different uh, you know, we would have turned off layers and just show certain image. But if we look at that file 10 years later and we try to plot it as a PDF because it was a turning point in internal at the office but in making design decision, well, the layers history, nobody can really tell us anything about it. Um, the plot size, everything looks like it's the same, um, I don't know, that it's a planted area or it was a water feature or whatever it was, everything is at the same level. You are losing this uh, layering. Other questions? Oh, here's one. Katie has a question. Hi, Katie Pierce Meyer. Um, not that this addresses what that question is, but I'm wondering about how much any of you might use screenshots um, as ways of capturing some of those moments, and or and is that something you would use as a way of sharing information <coughs> at particular portion, or, you know, points in a design process? And if you do, are those things that you actually maintain as part of the archive for a project? Uh, I'll take. So uh, certainly we use screenshots, but they're not, I, I don't think they're typically used for design discussions. They're usually more on the technical side of things. So they're a very mundane ex explanatory things like this is the wrong color or the wrong size or something like that. Mm -hmm. I, I think this, uh, uh, so this is like it used, it, it would have to be part of a, a sort of more defined process that people would follow in our, our environment, mm -hmm. which is nearly impossible for me to get people to do so. And there is another question in the, you know, the people who are behind the column, I can't tell if you have your hands up. <laughs> Following up a little on, on Katie's question, I wonder whether as, as you, you work through these questions about archiving standards, any consideration is given to adding a, some narrative component to the, the project record in which participants would be asked to describe or recount some of the experiences of both creativity and collaboration that were part of the process. So uh, she had mentioned earlier about doing the I think it was you, the written narrative. So we, so we've had discussions internally about doing interview-based processes, not not actually for archiving purposes, but for knowledge transfer, because we have a very similar problem where, uh, if, 
it doesn't describe well, you're not going to learn from it, and you can't move between so forth, uh, move between projects and move information. So, I think the the tools probably would be that would that would be the mechanism we would look to, and audio and video are much simpler to use than having somebody write something or an email. Um, I think one of the sort of pieces that we, we always struggle with is, okay, how do you actually make an association of that simple recording to what it's relevant to in the project mm -hmm. and you end up with, you know, intranets and stuff that, oh, it's on there somewhere or, um, and that's, again, another kind of interoperable standard that no one has the same system and so you upgrade systems and you lost any connectivity. I mean, one of the, just as a quick aside, I've once put together a list of all the stuff we don't have standards for that <laughs> makes sense for us, and it's like 65 items long, right? So like just quick quick examples, what a 3D sketch looks like, you know, photogrammetry. Uh, there are standards, but like the odds of a designer knowing what f an open format photogrammetry standard is, I don't really even know. Um, point clouds, all these sort of things. So it's a... It's sort of a, I don't know, I like to use the term, we need an internet, not more standards. And if you think about it, like the internet made things connect better. We don't have that. We just have these little piles of stuff. So, I mean, that's my long-term view, how you make this more simple, but I'll stop there. Roger. My question, my question has to do with this idea that, I mean, there, there's a range of you up there from small design firms to large owners and uh, different industries. And I'm wondering, you know, the challenge of trying to um, uh, collect information and archive it, it, it's somewhat what you want to do for your own practice. And it's also somewhat driven by what your client or the owner wants to require. And if the owners are clearer about what they need and want, is that going to sort out some of the problems for the design world? And, you know, to some extent, standards are, are important for things we want to preserve. Uh, they maybe help you with the things you just want to have access to, but if the owners were doing more to push standardization of the information they want at the end of a project, would that help sort this out? And maybe is there any experience from the PLM world that might shed some light on that for us in the architecture and design world. Do you want to take it, Nick? Sure. Yeah, I think on the federal side, I mean, especially for our larger projects, we have very, very detailed um, contracts and then specifications that dictate deliverables. And I think at the end of the day, I mean, what we want to be able to do uh, with our projects is that, you know, the final deliverables that are produced either by the architect of record or through an as-built modification process by our contractors to turn over a set of drawings and specs and O&M manuals, et cetera, that allow the building to continue to be run, you know, going forward. I think where that does break down a little bit is, you know, we have a pretty good grasp on that for our larger products above $3 million. Products under that, um, you know, there's many more in terms of volume, and those are the projects where, you know, I mean, it's $25,000 to build out a small space somewhere, and so how do you get the smaller contractors that might be working on that stuff to comply with some of the more complex requirements of our bigger projects. Um, and so working that out is, you know, a struggle for us. So is, has anyone on the panel done a project for the GSA? And uh, what do you, uh, is it just deliverables for the GSA, Greg? Or is it, you know, does it really help you in the future go back? Of course, you can't use it because it's, it's, it's confidential and for your eyes only and all of that. Well, so we've certainly done GSA projects. We mm -hmm. have examples where uh, we were a sub to a, 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 in a party where none of that information that we even produced got handed over to the GSA, so that's one example, uh, even if we were using models and so forth. But I think to Roger's question, there's small areas during a design, and this is design specific, small areas within the design process that the standards can be used from a practical sense. But most of the time, I think they're seen as someone else's problem. And so we can, I can meet your problem, but I'm, I'm going to do, it's sort of an image that came to my head. There's this TV show that they ship things across the country, and it's a competition who can get it there first. 
And they don't care how you get it there. It just has to land there in one piece. And it's sort of how our industry works in that we don't really have the standards about how you get there. We have the standards about how it lands, right? And this is, I think, the challenge. Like, it's not a, it, it's not all that we can't deliver to a standard if needed to, but it's not one that the, the standards don't really apply in the process part. They apply in the landing part. So it's actually an additional step. So you say, yeah. okay, so we have our stuff. Well, so I think the, the specific thing is, from a technology perspective, there aren't tools that utilize standards that we can leverage for a business. There are tools that are historically seen as handover tools. And so the, uh, it's a very big discussion, but I think it's generally the, the way I view things, that it's there's motivation to have status quo of vendors providing tools for certain workflow, and then open formats for handover and that's sort of at least how I view. Yeah. So, you know, I, I uh, your your question is a great one because it it sort of takes me back to imagining looking at an owner architect uh, AIA agreement and trying to use that as a basis for explaining to a client what is about to happen, and and it's does not. You know, if, if, if you read the description of schematic design in, in the AIA, it just basically has a line about uh, planning and organization, and maybe there's a narrative, what, what are you going to get? Meanwhile, books have been written, or attempt, there have been attempts made at explaining to a client what the design process is like, but those descriptions only were, are only about some preconception. The AI has a little film about you and your architect and what it could be, but it's a, but it's a, but it's a, you know, about a really pretty big building, and I would never think about using that for a for a house renovation. Uh, so you know, a, a great tool would would be probably for for some group of us to figure out how to put together a little introductory film about how the process works, and that starts to adjust the behavior of all the stakeholders. Uh, and, and particularly explains who is in charge at each step and who to turn to. So. Please introduce yourself. Uh, hi. Um, so one of the things that... You okay. are. You are. What, is it on? No, know. you. No, who are you? <laughs> who are you? What's your name? What's your name? Just... What's your Oh, hi. <laughs> I'm Carrie Moran, and I'm actually one of the people in partnership with Mark <laughs> Rylander on uh, several occasions. Um, one of the things that I, I've been thinking about is how we are so far removed as architects from the Thomas U. Walter era, where his office would have been the repository of all the data, and that you could go back to the office and it would be there. Because once you start talking about deliverables, and the deliverables are required to be manipulated. How do we, as architects, put our fingerprint on those? Because um, Ms. Leventhal brought up that even within the office, it's hard to understand the process by which these things get developed. So once you release your deliverable to the owner, and I mean, if any architects in the room remember, it was only a few years ago that we would never release an original of any kind to an owner, we would release a print, and that would be a reference. And now we're being pressured to release man manipulatable drawings to owners for future use. How do we put a fingerprint on it so that it can go back to the originator? Because when it comes to digi digital archiving, you know, Thomas U. Walter had a cornerstone with his name on it. Do we now? Probably not, for the most part. People won't even remember who the architect was. I doubt very many people go to Boeing and say, could I have a manipulatable drawing of my B-52 because I want to screw around with it in the future? I don't think so. That doesn't happen. But people want to do that with buildings all the time. So how do we actually document what was meant to be documented in the first place? And how do we keep that for perpetuity? You don't like 
read on uh -oh. <laughs> Probably the person who might have some thoughts on that is Greg, I mean, to some extent. Well, I mean, I've thought about these problems, but, like, actual solutions is not, like, something like, like blockchain, right? That's how, that's how you solve all problems today right now, is just to say blockchain. <laughs> but, I mean, this is, this is a realistic interpretation to this problem, right? You have to have a, a, a ledger of all these things that happen. And they, that's the promise of these technologies. I think what we find is they're not easily implementable in our industry because... Uh, one of the, even to, to hear Nick talk, we actually don't have owners. And when I'm saying owners, I'm saying process owners. We're not building owners. Uh, no one owns a process. We all own a little piece of it. And so, you know, from a, uh, you know, pie in the sky, if you look at what the Internet tells you, that's definitely the way we need to go. How we get there, I have no idea right now. So, I mean... Uh, Maybe Phil could talk a little bit about uh, the whole configuration management, uh, uh, product management issue in aerospace and how it's sort of handled at a high level. Well, you, you had said something about that uh, we don't give the B-52 CAD model to uh, the Air Force, but because there isn't one. Uh, but anyway, <laughs> I, what, I'm going to address that first. Actually. I do see the DOD requesting not an entire weapon system per se, but, you know, give me the wings on the A7 because I want to re-engineer them and, or I want to have somebody else re-engineer them. So I, I do see that quite a bit these days. Um, the other part of that question kind of had to do with, I think, I think it had to do with traceability, if you will, at least that's what I'm going to call it. But um, in the aerospace industry, they're very religious about, you know, if, if the left-hand bracket is your design, it is, it is associated with you and the organization for which you work. So if there's a question about that left-hand bracket, you know, some number of years down the road, they, they do indeed know who designed it. But, you know, whether he's with, the company anymore, you know, that's a different story and that's out of our control, so. But how do you do that? How do you do what? How do you keep track of that information? Our, our data model supports that. It, it's, it, it's, the entities are called person and organization. It's, and I, the it's IFC not, data models it, it's, supports ownership, it, it's, you know, it's created, it, yeah. But I think, I mean, from in your, like, let's say I'm going to design a plane, like, let's say do something smaller, I want to do a, a single engine prop plane. If I have a supply chain, I set up a, a PLM platform that everybody connects to, and then that's how you put it together, right? I mean, that's, I think that's the, the sort of the root of your question, that people point to that a PLM system or platforms and stuff like that as a way we could solve our industry, but it, okay, who hosts it? Who maintains it, like, in our industry? It's, it's like... Okay, who pays the rent on the system after the project yeah, starts? And in our, in our case, it's Cessna and Gulfstream yep. and Embraer, Advent Infinitum, whoever the company is. Yeah. But it's interesting in the IFC model, because we did a bunch of what are called the experimental BIMs for the Corps of Engineers, and I would go to a trade show and see some company 20 steps removed from us, and they'd be showing something they did with these experimental models, and I'd look at it, and if you looked at created by, it would be cskender at kfa-inc.com. And so that was maintained through the model, despite all the people, in IFC format, all the people who were manipulating it and adding to it and all of that. Roger. Well, following up on my... Yeah, I'm part. sorry, we need you to... Oh, Roger. Roger Grant. Roger Grant, National Institute of Building Sciences. Sorry to introduce myself earlier. But following up on the question I was asking, this is interesting because who was driving that is Department of Defense, the owner, saying we want this and they want to be able to validate it. And I think, you know, is that's the challenge we face. We don't, I don't know, GSA has a lot of market power, but do they have enough to drive this through like manufacturing does? How do we get to that in, in the AEC realm? Are, or will we ever get there? I don't know. Does anybody want to take a crack at that? Yeah. Um, I mean, I think in terms of BIM usage, uh, GSA has been kind of pushing that since I've been at the agency since 2003. Um, so, you know, today, at least for our products that are above 
um, $3 million, every one of those products has some type of BIM usage on that project, whether it's spatial data modeling or whether it's you know, something more involved in terms of taking that model through design. Um, I guess in terms of though the idea of making sure that the, the architect or the designer is always attached to the work that they did, I think we probably could do better in that area. We definitely do that for um, equipment that we install. We always know who um, made the faulty equipment that we now have to take out of the building. But for you know the renovations and stuff like that, you know if you're not doing a new building, I think over time, kind of that that tracking of who did what does get lost. Hi, Stacy Bias with the Architect of the Capitol. Um, this kind of goes on with my thought because the defense industry has, in fact, driven like records management requirements, and the space industry has uh, driven what we now know as the OEIS standard. Um, do you see the opportunity, or is that, in fact, desirable for the <coughs> aid community to be able to drive, like, this is our requirement, and if you want to sell us a system that is compliant, maybe a soft C or something, it must be able to um, conform the data for the purpose of archiving. Because right now, what we're faced with is like, okay, we wrap up a project in a massive system that a contractor has used, and then it's like, okay, here's your zip file, you know, here are your CDs with all the data, and it's very raw. Um, and then the challenges of trying to do the verification and all on the archival side. But do you see that if there's an opportunity um, for our industry to drive that the softwares, especially the preeminent software companies, are adding modules in to their software packages that create, you know, the archival pra the archival packages that the archivists are going to need to be able to have some kind of reliability that we can preserve the formats that were created. I would say so. One of the things that you find in in a lot of client requirements is we're good at doing what we know can be tested. Uh, be extremely, you know, sort of blunt about it. So if the client has a very good standard and they're going to test that we're delivering to it, we can deliver to it. But the second that says, you know, someone in a meeting says, eh, not a big deal, well, it's not a big deal to us anymore. And so one of the things that I think that comes with standards is the ability to make sure you're receiving them, right? And Part of, the, I think, from a technology standpoint, the standards that exist today could be delivered on on every project. I don't think that's a question. It's actually just a will to enforce them that is uh, a much more difficult one because it actually, you could look at it in two ways. There are technologies that make it easy to enforce or there you either have the staff to enforce them. And no one has that money lying around until somebody sees it as a business model to enforce from a technology perspective. It's at least how I see it, that, that, that we won't get better at delivering it. And that, well, that's I, from a handover standpoint. Yeah, I, I was talking to a BIM manager at a contractor. He said, so, you know, when the VA comes out with, you know, you're going to deliver this based on our BIM standard, before we bid, I got to call them and kind of feel them out and figure out whether they know what they're asking for. And if they don't, we figure we won't do it and we don't charge them for it. If they do, then we figure we have to do it and we charge it for them. So that's, I mean, that's really the rationale that people use. And, you know, when we, yeah, I mean, we've built validators and things so that clients can know they're getting what they wanted, but yeah. Kimono Numa, Onuma Inc. Um, one thought here as far as the ownership and how do we track uh, ownership of information, I think we're still stuck. If you look at this morning, we, the, the talk about we used to even be bound to the hardware that we used. The applications used to be bound to that and fused to it. In many ways, we're still bound with our data to the applications that we use and the software that we use. But if we look at a transaction-based thing and we can track the transaction, you can actually track ownership. And it's actually staring us right on the screen right there. So when we, when we tweet to the hashtag there, it actually says where we are and we post to that location, that information about what we're seeing in this room, which can be traced in many different, you can search it on Google and all kinds of stuff. So the technology is already there. I would encourage us to look in terms of how do we track information and look in a more transactional based tra uh, way to look at it. And then you can start identifying ownership. It goes back to blockchain and a lot of other things. Obviously, we're not going to get there overnight, but if we think in those terms, I think we could get there faster.
Hello, my name is Laura from Georgetown University. This is a comment to Mark and kind of following up what he was mentioning. You mentioned that you have a problem when you try to find the images. So have you have a thought about if you tag the image or <coughs> add meta tags, so probably they will be easier, you will be searchable, so you will not have to go find a folder by folder to find them. You just have to search your your C drive or whatever you have in store or just a comment. On. Yeah, well, you know, I think if there were if there were a package, first of all, if there were, if there were some image management software that was better than what's out there, I, a friend of mine referred to iPhoto as Satan's work last week. Um, <laughs> that that uh, you know, I we would probably use tags if you could just have your tags as part of the software and you click them. You could create your own tags. You could work that out with the client <coughs> and the rest of your design team, and that, that actually would be really useful. I think tagging is, you know, it's work. It, it's how Google works. So, <laughs> I, I, so we're imp implementing uh, search technologies, and we won't touch mm -hmm. anything that doesn't do just do machine learning on images this, these days because people aren't going to do it. I mean, we we have used tagging systems in our internal structure for a long time, and maybe we get one of a hundred people that use tags. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so. Uh, uh, there's obviously technological solutions to bad data management that are becoming more available. So, I mean, that's a sliver of the problem, but I think that's a meaningful way to look at it. So even this, in, this, in this discussion, like the domain models for image recognition for our industry are not open. There are no, so I don't think there's open data sets. This is a very good example. Like the training data that you need to, oh, that's a crane, that's a, a duct. You know, those are all, as far as I know, proprietary data sets that people are using to train their systems. So this is a perfect example where we're, we self-compound on the problems and, you know, now you just pay for the subscription to get the machine learning algorithm to find your images in the future. You probably shouldn't ask that kind of question in an architect or they will create their own proprietary system <laughs> that no one else can use. Tim? Um, Tim Walsh, the Canadian Center for Architecture. Um, you know, I think we all know these BIM diagrams where it's like this one model will follow a thing from its initial sort of design development through to the deliverable and then it goes to the facilities manager and then it's used for every renovation forever and it tracks the building until demolition at least. You know, maybe we're often not in there, but sometimes maybe you also consider that that would get copied out to a collecting institution at some point for like sort of permanent retention. And I think this is mostly a question for Nick, but I mean, to what degree is that actually happening? Like these deliverables that come to you, do they get reused? Yeah, I mean, I think they get reused. We haven't had, um, I don't think, a new building go all the way through using BIM through the entire thing, and now we're solely using that model to then manage the building. Um, I think that over the last 10 years, we have gotten more advanced in what we're using BIM for, and we have had projects take BIM all the way through design, through construction, and you have a a fairly good BIM model at the end, but the issue still that I have and that the agency has is that, um, you know, maintaining that BIM model with all the small products that happen in it, or happen in the building after that BIM model is turned over, yeah, quite frankly, you know, a lot of our people, you know, aren't, don't have experience doing that, um, so we'd have to hire contractors to do it, so I think the maintenance of that model through after the product still becomes a huge issue for us. Yeah, I think uh, on that, I, we've done a lot of studies for organizations who wanted to get into some kind of uh, data turnover or BIM or, you know, some things like that. And what we always find is <clears throat> there are some things that they have staffed they really don't need to do anymore. I mean, I'm talking about large organizations. These are kind of redundant jobs. But then there are some really missing activities, missing jobs. And, you know, I mean, we think technology just takes away jobs, but it also creates some requirements and some new jobs. And, you know, if you don't staff those jobs, i.e., you know, somebody who's going to sort of know what's going on in the building and make sure the BIM gets maintained, um, even though you can do with many fewer CAD operators somewhere else, um, you're not really going to get the benefits. And that's what we found over and over with large owners. Sorry, I have another question, Eliza from Sasaki. Um, it's 
just kind of a, and maybe an enduring, I realize we're close to the end, but um, because you all work in various disciplines, um, what, are, what are some of the struggles that you have working at, from your discipline to another design discipline and communicating? I know, Greg, you said when it comes to working with another firm, you're able to decide on what standards work for you and develop that, but um, even within Sasaki, we have conversations about how can landscape architects better communicate with architects and how does that work with a planning project on top of that kind of thing. And so I wonder if you can explore that a little bit because as experts who already have the learning curve covered, um, it would be great to know like what are the struggle pain points that you experience looking at, at different disciplines, files, and trying to integrate them into your own. I feel for you more than me because <laughs> you probably get the short end of the stick, so I'll let you go first. <laughs> um, we don't do uh, BIM. We provide CAD drawing for the architects to then plug into their um, set. Um, we, um, in, this is getting out of BIM for a little bit, but in uh, different uh, visualization is very important in landscape. Um, and in speaking with uh, architects or other consultants on the team and the client. Um, a landscape is something that changes all the time, so it's very hard to represent. There's not an AutoCAD block or anything that would truly represent what you are designing. So we've um, experienced with different software. At the moment, we are using Lumion in order to very quickly uh, create a visualization of um, trees and grasses and shrubs. Um, no architect we're working with are using Lumion at the moment. So that means that we need to take their model, clean it up in Rhino, then uh, put it in Lumion. In Lumion, we, uh, we design the landscape in 3D. Um, and that's suddenly to create the image of the design. We, can no longer, we cannot give that Lumion model to the architect to figure out what the planting plan would be. We need to go back to AutoCAD and then draw. So there is a lot of um, sort of dead end, in a way, that we need to, to go to in order for the design to process. But for to communicating with uh, other consultants, we need to go back to CAD. That's how we where we are stuck at the moment. Well, so on this particular problem, we've actually, so the, the game world is actually quite open and Lumion is like a game engine. It's, it, we've actually started to do things where we move towards the game engine tools and tools built on top of game engines so we can always get access to the source code and extract the tree location, <laughs> if you will, in the future versus having these dead ends. But these are you know, specialists that, you know, uh, finding a game developer that work for an architecture salary is very hard, those sort of things. <laughs> uh, but, I mean, th those are the places that uh, we're a big firm we can try to explore, but they're not sustainable. Uh, and these dead ends exist everywhere. I think on the building side, working with partners, it's, you know, everybody knows what the problems are if you're using certain BIM platforms. Oh, we have to do this. Uh, Everybody has the same issues where we can't track changes and uh, things. I have to get an email that says what's changed, those sort of things. Um, I don't know. It's a systemic problem. It's not uh, not unique to us, though. Okay, so thank you. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.